What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Fantasy Files podcast, where we talk about our favorite fantasy series and topics. I am the prettiest girl at the party, Spencer. And next up, his sock is suing him for sexual harassment. It's Gabe. Last but not least, if his Warhammer figurines could talk, he'd have so many friends. It's (laughs) RJ Bailey. (laughs) <laughs> you all should know who RJ is by now if you watch our channel, but just in case you don't, uh, we'll introduce him in just a moment. But first, Gabe, how are you doing and what are we doing here today? I am doing wonderful, Spencer. Today, we're having a Creator's Corner episode where we talk about content creation. And we, of course, we have RJ Bailey here, so I'm excited. Me too. Yes, we will be talking with RJ about the multiple ways that he creates content, and then we'll go on to shoot the shit for the rest of the episode where we could literally talk about anything, whether it be aliens, ghosts, cars, or what happened to Prince Harry to make him the way (laughs) he is. Uh, As always, subscribe and like, and without further ado, let's introduce our guest. Uh, RJ, it is fantastic to have you on again you are one of our best friends of the channel you and holly are like our two best friends of the channel so it's always awesome to have you guys on um for the people you know you you came on a while ago and you did a uh, an episode where we kind of did a whole interview about your audiobook and narrating and voiceover career Mm -hmm. uh and I highly recommend people go watch that. But in case they haven't, who are you? What do you do? And where can people follow you? Yeah, I'm uh, RJ. Uh, I am a voice actor, so mostly doing audiobook narrations. Uh, but I've done all, all kinds of stuff as well. And you can follow me on Twitter, at RJ Bailey. Um, or if you just go to the my link tree, uh, L link tr dot ee forward slash rj bailey just do yeah. a search for linktree rj bailey and i'm sure you'll find it nice. b-a-y-l-e-y nice. yeah and and all my links are there i'm on facebook i'm on instagram i'm everywhere oh you're still on facebook are people even over there anymore <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> yeah people like old people like me older people like me yeah. who can't let it go they've invested too many hours I know. into it yeah. i know i i use facebook for my um just something that holds my photos dig- digitally yeah yeah just, just somewhere to put my photos <laughs> mm-hmm. i recently joined tiktok and i feel like such an old man oh, um, I, I open it up and it's just like what is all of like i, I do not I hate understand it. this i, I love I, tiktok i, I love hate it. tiktok with a fury passion <laughs> i oh my god i don't get me started yeah i, think, I say I, don't start don't start <laughs> I, I think it's like corroding the minds of people nowadays but. <laughs> <laughs> i joined it right and i've this yeah. is like how much of an old man i felt like I joined it and then like, because I wasn't following anyone, it was just showing me popular content. Yeah. And so like, it just showed me like this woman faking um, pleasure, aroused oh. pleasure. Right? <laughs> yeah. and, and so I was like, I wanted to get rid of it and move it up, but I accidentally, I pressed a button that was repost it. So oh, I reposted no. it and then I, and then I had to go and Google how to undo a repost oh my gosh. on uh, oh. on TikTok. But now, because that's like the only post I've interacted with, it sends me alerts, <laughs> like push notifications to my yep. phone that this one sexy lady is posted again. And now I just get sexy lady stream. And that's not what I want on there. Oh, I don't really man. know what I want on there, but it's not really that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my yep. God, that is... That is the perfect example of <laughs> somebody who, like, like that's like something I would do. Like, oh, what is this thing? And then just yeah. like stumbling over and like, <laughs> oh my god, it's like, like the only person who follows me is like a couple of friends and um, an audiobook producer. And I was like, I hope my audiobook <laughs> producer has not seen me just <laughs> reposting sexy ladies making aroused noises. <laughs> well, you know it. it it makes a lot of sense for you uh, to do TikTok, though, because a lot of people are using that for business and having huge yeah. success with that. Like you could post like various clips of your narration and, mm-hmm. you know, that could be 
one of your Linktree things and it would probably get a lot of the, you know, younger writers who are on mm -hmm. uh, TikTok a lot because they all they all love book talk and whatnot. And so, yeah, that that could actually be really, uh, really lucrative. What is book talk? Uh, well, so book talk is just like book TikTok. So it's it's people like like us or like, mm -hmm. you know, other book reviewers who do like little uh, book things on TikTok like oh, okay. book reviews and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Uh, just like, like book, Twitter, book, talk, book, sure. tube, that is, it's all that same yeah. kind of stuff. I've been taught, you know, I know a, a few narrators go on TikTok. So I've decided that's why I joined. I was like, yeah, I'm going to do some narration on TikTok and we'll yep. see where that takes me. We'll try that out. Yeah. And I, I bet it'll be really lucrative. Sorry. MJ Kuhn has a TikTok and I follow her and that's, that's what yeah. she does. She just oh. posts about different books, her the books she's written doing like little short reviews and stuff like that and mm -hmm. yeah she's pretty popular she's got 40,000 followers yeah i was Ooh, gonna say she's... i'll have some of that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah she's she's got a lot of uh she's got a lot of followers on there i've been i guess not su surprised by her success more just like astounded i guess yeah mm -hmm. but uh yeah i you know speaking of social media i fairly recently picked up uh snapchat because there's like a whole you know subset of my friends that are all in like a group chat on there and so i was like fine i'll i'll get snapchat and just use it for this you know group thing mm -hmm. um and i hate it god i hate it yeah i hate it so much and like i know gabe loves it and gabe and i have talked a few times on snapchat and i have to admit it is nice for like sending a video because sending a video over text is such a huge pain in the ass. Yeah. It can only be like a certain size, even if you're on Wi-Fi, and it's it's just a huge pain. So Snapchat is really nice for that. But dude, I get notifications all the time. This person has uploaded a story or whatever. Uh -huh. and I'm just like, I just I just want to talk to the the two friends that I have mm -hmm. on here. That's all I want to do. And I, oh my God, I got to. I'm the same. It's because it's like <laughs> trying to get you to use it, isn't it? Oh yeah. But like, oh, yeah. If anything, it's just making me angry at it. Yeah. And not <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once, once a month, I get a, a picture of, of Spencer's dog once every yeah. like 30 days or so. <laughs> just out of, nowhere, out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. Peak yep. content. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. All right. So let's, yeah, let's go into talking about some uh, content creation here. Uh, like I said, we had you on for um, that interview about your whole career as an audiobook narrator. And I'm sure that we'll talk about that more as, you know, we go on in this episode. Um, but as far as content creation, uh, I'd really like to talk about like your your metal empire and mm -hmm. the the Bailey's bookshelf you have and if you have anything else that you've been working on um because I I haven't checked out metal empire just because that's not my type of music really but mm -hmm. I I have enjoyed Bailey's bookshelf in the past so how oh, good thank you yeah how how did you start these why did you start them how have they been going so Bailey's Bookshelf, I suppose, is one I've I've been a huge fan. I, I love podcasts. I'm a huge podcast fan. I've been listening to them since their early days when it was a real wild, kind of like Wild West DIY yeah. made yeah. with like cellar tape and and cardboard type shows <laughs> yeah. before like, you know, I got into it when there was like all pretty much no or got into listening to it when there was no prof no such thing as a professional podcaster right like yeah. um or there was like one in the uk there was one professional podcaster in the uk yeah. um and uh and i've always loved the medium um and so um i've always quite wanted to do a podcast and it, I was also aware that like, I don't, this is, I wanted to do like, I, I, I would love to do a, a, an audiobook narration of a legendary book. And I grew up listening to um, the War of the Worlds uh, album by mm. Jeff Wayne, the musical version. And if anyone's not heard that, that is like a, an amazing piece of art. Like it's a concept album with narration. So it's part audiobook, cool. part 
uh 70s rock opera it's amazing oh so is it, um, is it the whole is it the whole book or is it just so like it's not excerpts? the whole book no okay. it's it's excerpts and then like songs fill in some of the story as well it's wow. narrated by richard burton who's got an incredible voice he's like a uh, an old he's long deceased now but an old school brilliant british mm. actor um who i t- and his narration of the war of the worlds in that is a huge probably my biggest influence and one of the reasons why I love voice acting and stuff because I just wow his voice is incredible mm. so I I I always wanted to read listen to the war of the worlds and when I was little I wanted to hear the audiobook of I assumed out there there was an audiobook narrated by Richard Burton of the whole thing and I really wanted to listen to it and I was gutted when I discovered there wasn't oh. um so I and I always wanted to to read the War of the Worlds, but I'm terrible at reading, like with my wow. eyes. I'm definitely a listener. Like I, I'm terrible at reading. You know, I'm awful. The only way I'll sit and read a book is if I'm paid to do it, literally. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm a, just an audiobook listener. And because there wasn't one, but I desperately wanted to read the War of the Worlds, I was like, well, it's coming into public domain soon. I was like. I could read The War of the Worlds, sure. Or, and then this is an awful habit. Maybe I need to get out of this, like trying to turn everything into work or something. But I was like, or I could read The War of the Worlds out loud into a microphone and then just publish it because yeah. it's public domain. So, yeah. and, I, and I, and I think I maybe yeah I could be wrong but I didn't hear at the time and I still don't hear a lot of high quality um audiobook podcasts like which are just straight up professional level audiobook podcasts I've heard ones which are recorded on a not very good mic with a um perhaps not my uh cup of tea when it comes to narration and performance abilities mm, or style sure. um so I just thought, like, there seems to be a gap of, like, um, audiobook podcasts out there, free audiobooks. Like, this is all public domain. Whereas if you go on to, God, I can't remember the name of the website, but there is, it's where I got it from. There's a public domain website, um, which has loads of, like, thousands of public domain titles that you can download in multiple formats and read, much like The War of the Worlds, much like Dracula, the Sherlock Holmes, mm. all that stuff. Um, so I thought, well, I'd like to make that book in audiobook format or as a podcast as well. Um, so yeah, I, I started off doing that. And it occurred to me that there are other books that I feel like I should have read, like Dracula, yeah. you know? Um, so I was like, well, that's if I'm the person, you know, but I was just, I don't know. I, they seem like, you know, audiobooks are a lot of money if you don't yeah. use a token. Right. Um, you know, an audible credit or something like that. So I was like, well, if I feel like I should have read these books, but they cost quite a bit of money, I was like, well, if I put them out for free as a podcast, then there's there's surely other people who feel like they should have read Dracula or they should have read The War of the Worlds, right. who now have no excuse not to because yep. I've created <laughs> a, a good kind of, well, in yeah. my estimation, a good audiobook equivalent that's available for absolutely free right. and you know I, I think passive income is very appealing to me so I thought if I get enough downloads after a while hopefully I'll just get adverts on it and then that can just start generating some money as well so that's how it started nice. basically I, it was also promotion because I was like well what's you know you do audiobook demos you know if people go to my uh, Twitter they'll probably see an audiobook demo or a video game demo pinned yeah. to the top you know is my pinned tweet and i was like well, what's better promotion than just some samples of audiobook yeah. what about a whole audiobook yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. here's a whole audiobook to hear, see, yeah. hear what i can do so it was it was a marketing thing as well but then i was like well if it makes some money on top of that that's brilliant as, as a product in its own right so it was a way of satisfying myself forcing myself to read some classics that i hadn't but you know, I'm a big fan of sci-fi, alien invasion. I'm a big fan of horror. Yeah. But I hadn't read, like, these extremely important pieces of art in those genres. So 
it was a great way of satisfying that as well as marketing and hopefully making some money from it down the line. So that's, that's where it comes from. Nice. Yeah. I, I had never, I had never really thought about public domain stuff because you could like whatever's public domain, like mm. y- you could make your own audiobook and sell it. Right. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Which wow. is what I've done with yeah. audiobook empire um, who are a production company I've worked with quite a lot with now. Um, okay. I'm pals with uh, the empress of Audiobook Empire, Jess. Oh, cool. And so she's helped me. um, I say help. She's done most of the work. Put it on (laughs) to get my podcast. And then I've basically taken out all of the podcasty promotional stuff. Right. And then turned it into a normal traditional audiobook. And now Dracula is available all over, you know, on on different audiobook websites. If people want to hear it as a traditional audiobook, so that's cool. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, awesome. So yeah, you can just sell it, and that's why you see so many Sherlock Holmes adaptations, so many uh, Dracula adaptations, because you don't have to pay anyone. Right. Like, mm. There's no rights to secure. Right. Um, it's just do whatever you want with it for absolutely free. I was just gonna ask about kind of the. I don't know anything about public domain. How how long does it take or is there a certain set of things that have to happen for a book to become public domain? It's different in um, America, I know. However, in the UK, it's things are automatically public domain if it is um, 70 years after the author has died. That's wow. when copyright expires. Oh, okay. So okay. Um, this year it was the last Sherlock Holmes novels. Oh no, I think it's actually, I think it might be 70 years after publication. Yeah, I think it is in the UK, 70 years after publication. Gotcha. Because certain public uh, Sherlock Holmes books were public domain, but this year, the last published Sherlock Holmes books have become public domain. So now Uh, everything is public domain, yeah. Uh, So that's how it works in in the UK at least. And because I'm in the UK, I'm I'm going off UK copyright law. Nice, nice. Yeah, have have you guys seen how uh, Winnie the Pooh has gone public domain, and yeah. now they have all these like horror movies with Winnie the Pooh? Oh, that no. looks so good. Yeah. I haven't even looks seen amazing. those, man. I have yeah. to Google that really quick. Yeah, type it. Yeah, Winnie the Pooh horror movie. It looks like absolutely hilarious. It's called Blood and Honey. Blood, Blood and Honey. honey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's awesome. So funny. That's wait. awesome. There, there was another one. I, I forget what the other one was. There, there was another thing that was public domain that ended up as a horror movie recently, but I can't remember what it was. But yeah. Yeah, public domain's quite weird as well because there's something like, I think a very famous example is um, The Night of the Living Dead. And there was some issue with copyright there. Um, so it was when it was released, it was kind of like accidentally immediately released into the public domain. There was no copyright on it. So, or they didn't do a copyright notice on it, Oh, yes. um, which means like it was an error. So it was instantly in the public domain. So anyone, you will find a million shoddy versions, DVDs of the Night of the Living Dead because wow, you can just get a copy of that movie, burn it onto a DVD and sell it. And that's why there were plenty of, you know, remakes and sequels that were illegitimate. See, you know, yeah. wow, okay, not were not with George Romero's blessing at all on them. So yeah, uh, oh, that's a weird man. one. Crazy, that's, that's wild. Mm-hmm. Did you find the Winnie the Pooh? Uh, I did. I, yeah, <laughs> I saw it. I, I'll, I'll watch the trailer after. It looks looks yeah. freaking awesome though. It comes out yeah. February fifteenth next month oh nice yeah. okay cool yeah i definitely i mean it's gotten so much hype by now like mm-hmm. it's such a it's such like one of those internet things that everybody yeah. went crazy yep. about for a while i'm like i gotta see it i gotta go yeah i gotta go watch it um and, and you had mentioned also kind of this this whole start of podcasting and i, I think that that's kind of a interesting timeline as well because the first podcast I ever remember seeing, um, and audiobook podcasts weren't even a thing back then, was mm-hmm. uh, it was called This American Life. And it was like the most popular podcast here in America when I was in, it, it, it had to have been 
like at the end of high school is when mm-hmm. they started getting kind of popular and then not really taking off for years after that. But yeah, this American life was like the biggest one that I had known about. Um, and then, you know, you, you get everybody my age around that time saying, you know, why would I ever listen to a podcast? Like why, you know, that doesn't sound fun at all. But then as you go on, you get the uh, Joe Rogan podcast. Right. Yeah. And he starts having on all these guests that are like, Mm. oh, he's talking to like this super famous person that I like from movies. Like I should tune tune in for this. And Mm -hmm. then you get, you know, over the next few years, you get other celebrities who start their own podcasts and do the same thing. So it, it kind of becomes, you know, if you have Spotify, it's kind of this ever rotating wheel of, oh, this guest is on this week, this guest. And so all of a sudden people are tuning in for podcasts all the yeah. time. Yeah. And then you get things like, uh, like booktube popping up, uh, you know, just YouTubers or, you know, not necessarily booktube, but even like Warhammer or yeah. anything, movies, whatever. And all these YouTubers are kind of specializing in these things. And it's mm-hmm. like, oh, people will like pay attention if we talk about, you know, these things that we love. Yeah. Yeah. And from there, it kind of got to where it is now where, you know, so many people have a podcast. I, I, somebody on Twitter, I think like a week ago was saying, uh, how did they phrase it? They're like, Hey, let's start a podcast is the new, Hey, let's start a garage band. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And I I really like that. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's really true. I I had a ton of friends and, you know, early high school and, you know, into college and stuff that all were like, we're going to start a band and they, you know, have some band out of the garage and they'd all yeah. jam together. And it's very much the same thing. I, like in a, in a similar way, like we all kind of, you know, spend money on all this equipment for this hobby and we, we get together and do this thing. And yeah, I think that's a very apt comparison. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> 50% of the time is a true crime podcast as well it seems yeah yeah, yeah. yep every dude everybody loves their true crime podcast especially i notice a lot of the uh either boyfriend girlfriend podcasts or like the husband and wife podcast they'll get right, into yeah. true crime together and then they'll <laughs> do like a podcast on whatever they read or watched or whatever recently i think that's really funny yeah yeah and uh, and you had mentioned how like professional podcasting wasn't really a thing before. And I think mm. that's another thing that Joe Rogan kind of opened up. It's like, oh, you can do this and like make money because a lot of us just do this as a hobby. Like, yeah, you know, Gabe and I don't make any money from this. Totally. And so like then you have like Joe Rogan and, and all these other podcasts that start popping up um, that are more or less nobodies. I mean, you have your like celebrity podcast, but then you have your guys who are just your average guys who spent a lot of money on equipment and stuff and just made like a really high quality podcast. And yeah, now, now they're rolling in it. Like, uh, mm-hmm. the, like the kind of funny podcast, they were three guys from IGN. They just reviewed video games. And then one day they decided to up and leave and they created a podcast studio in their spare bedroom. And they did that for like a couple of years, I think. And then they moved to like an actual house and had like a, a full room to do their podcasting in. Wow, and had yeah. Another room for an office. And now they're in like a big ass warehouse, like a huge studio. Wow. Putting on like these super high budget, like, you know, shows and stuff. It's It's yeah. wild to see how how it's evolved and and what it's become you it's know. incredible i love it i'm so i'm so pleased it's taken off like because like you said you know with the youtube it's the same kind of thing uh with podcasts it's like most of my entertainment now visually uh you know filmed is youtube and podcasts it's and the reason for that is the same reason why podcasts are so popular and why i love them so much because I can watch, there's someone out there making probably decent content on the really niche thing that I like. Mm. Where, whereas before, like you, you know, when I was growing up, when I didn't have the internet, it, you know, we, we got the internet fairly late in our house anyway. But like, 
when I was growing up, you know, you'd put the TV on and you'd see what's on and you'd just watch it. And it's like, <laughs> oh, because that's what's on TV. Yeah. Right. Uh, um, you know, you would be restricted to whatever broad demographic stuff there was because there just wasn't the market for like in-depth Warhammer tutorial. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. Terrain, make terrain out of yogurt pot type, you know, yeah. videos. Yep. Whereas now, I, why, why do I need to watch something that I'm only tangentially interested in right. where I can go and watch something that, that is specific. Yeah. yeah. And because there's enough people who are into that, um, they do get enough money to do it full time. So they do it. The more they do it, the, the greater budget they have yeah. and resources they have to make even more impressive stuff about this extremely niche thing yeah. that I and uh, you know other fellow complete nerds are interested in. <laughs> yeah, it's it's wild, especially um, you know, especially for for us like reading books and stuff. What we'll typically do, or at least what I'll typically do, is we'll read a book for the podcast, and then you can just go to Spotify, and no matter how obscure or niche the book is, somebody has done an episode on it. Nice. And so, yeah. You know, it's it. There's so many podcasts out there that kind of fit into, uh, you know, whether they're specifically about fantasy or not. There's somebody out there who has talked about this book, um, mm -hmm. even if it's just you know a YouTube thing or whatever. And so I think that that's that's really cool. I really like how, you know, there's there's a lot of things that I blame the internet for, <laughs> but <laughs> bringing people together like this is sure. not one of them for sure. I, I feel like I reached the ultimate like apotheosis of my love of like podcasts <laughs> and heavy metal recently because I found an artist um, called Skynd S K Y N D, um, and they're a duo. They're like industrial progressive metal and they purely do songs about like true crime oh. and their songs, <laughs> yeah their songs are like just called john wayne gacy or um <laughs> eliza lamb or you know stuff like that so i reached i realized i, I like i had this moment of like just I don't know of, of an appropriate <laughs> metaphor, but like <laughs> it was like my ultimate like drugs, like taking a deliberately taking a massive overdose or like consuming <laughs> loads of like my favorite alcohol. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because I would list, I would queue up like the song skit, you know, by Skinned, Eliza Lamb. And then I would queue up the podcast so I could listen to the story <laughs> of it. And then I could like do it like and then I could go and listen to another true crime song about John Wayne Gacy and then a podcast about John Wayne Gacy. And I was yeah. like, this is like that's awesome. This <laughs> is my ultimate drugs. This that's is awesome. Awesome. yeah. What an age to live in. <laughs> yeah. I don't care, you know, never mind this making paraplegics be able to walk again like they do you know, <laughs> scientists in Poland doing. I can listen to true crime heavy <laughs> that, metal. That's right. And then true crime <laughs> podcasts. And not even have to touch my phone to yep. change between apps. Good God. It's like yeah. the future. I know. It's amazing. I'll have to check that out. That sounds so, so intriguing. Yeah, it's good. Uh, uh, it's uh, If you're into um, true crime, then do check out Skinned, even if you're not um, a fan. It's not heavy. It's not heavy, heavy. Yeah. yeah. Very catchy. So if you're into true crime, then listen to songs about John Wayne Gacy and stuff and Michelle <laughs> Carter. I just type in skinned. Okay. You said S-K-Y-N-D. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, it's the name of a troll in a Danish fairy tale. <laughs> oh, that that's cool. First thing that pops up. Nice. That's cool. They're an Australian band. You oh, might cool. see the lead singer, who is a lady, often dressed as a... Well, in, in the mo the promotional pictures I've seen as, as like a circus performer. No, like a ringmaster, you know, with the top oh, yeah. hat. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because... Their music video uh, is about John Wayne Gacy, and he was a clown, so they've done a whole circus. Yeah, okay, oh, I see thing. it. I got it. I got it ready. I'll listen to it after this. Yeah, it's good. So then, speaking of uh, music and heavy metal and stuff, you also do the Metal Empire. Do you want to talk a little? Because we talked about your audiobook. Yeah. One. Do, you, do you want to talk about the Metal Empire? Yeah. So basically. Um, thank you for letting me talk about it as well. Um, yeah. yeah, it's my heavy metal radio program. I have a deep, passionate love for heavy metal. Um, I, uh, I, I joined a community radio 
um, station years ago in Edinburgh and they got me and I was unemployed at the time. So they got me doing like a weekday talk show, which was a lot of fun and had a lot of, you know, where I, tr me and a producer um, who's my friend now, good friend of mine, Kat, um, she would line up guests or, and then I would interview the guests. And then when I got a job doing traffic and travel on the radio uh, for actual radio stations, paid for it um, on like BBC and smooth radio and stuff like that. Um, I, I could only do one kind of like community show a week. And I always had wanted to do like a rock show. Mostly it was heavy metal, but yeah. I did like some rock artists as well. I'm, I called it a, a rock show mostly so I could play heavy metal and then occasionally play lemon yeah. skinhead or something <laughs> yep. like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, and then that uh, radio station came to an end um, due to like some pretty bad mismanagement and some scandals. And so I went off to be like, right, I have to leave this. This is a nightmare. Yeah. Um, so I, I went and found an internet one, like because there is no such thing as a, I don't know, well, there are. There is like Kerrang radio and there's that's pretty much it. Other than that, I don't know of any like metal orientated radio stations in the UK, especially not broadcast on FM, things like that. So yeah. I found like an online one and then just just went in that direction because I was like, well, metal's my passion. I'll just look for metal ones yeah. because I was looking at a lot of rock ones and the music I wanted to play didn't seem to fit in there. And I thought if I do a metal one on a metal station, that's more likely to maybe attract a community. And I wanted to create, you know, a little community, um, a heavy metal community. So yeah, I, I've just carried it on from that. And I've been doing it for several, yeah, years now, probably, probably five years, uh, four years, uh, maybe four years of the heavy metal show. And then before that, like maybe another couple of years of the rock show. Um, and I, I, it's just, a passion of me mine that I love and it ties into fantasy because I remember growing up again and you didn't have Spotify when I was doing my paper round and stuff right but when I came across heavy metal it was probably Iron Maiden I was like I've been listening to you know songs on the radio about love and falling in love and falling out of love yeah. and parties and breakups and relationships and then like I heard some heavy metal and it was like hold on there are songs yeah. about dragons. Yeah. And, yeah. And <laughs> and like elves fighting orcs and stuff. Yeah. Oh my god. And like demons <laughs> and wizards. Yeah. Oh, this is <laughs> for me. That's yeah, awesome. For me. So yeah, I was like, why have I been listening to this? Well, like, you know, middle of the road pop nonsense. Yeah. When I could have been listening to the ancient forest of elves by Luca Terilli. That is yeah. a you know a real song. <laughs> like, uh, that's awesome on the album i think it's lords of winter twilight which is like it's just yeah <laughs> it opened uh, it, it was just it, it was everything i wanted in music it, yes basically because it was like fantasy kind of sci-fi stuff and it was like, mostly fantasy i'm traditionally more of a sci-fi fan actually but like i yeah. love fantasy so like to just come across this genre which was just like all very exciting empowering music about yeah. like dragons or the lord of the rings <laughs> you know like led zeppelin yeah. have songs about the lord of the rings you know misty mountain hop and stuff are, are is literally a song about the lord of the rings oh that's cool black sabbath is songs you know about i love horror so songs about demons and and satan and all very cool stuff like that and and heavy metal has been a huge therapy to me in my life uh, i find it extremely cathartic I suffer with very, very bad depression sometimes. And heavy metal is such an empowering, positive, cathartic um, force, you know, genre of music yep. that like, I, I'm just so very, very passionate about it and the, for, the good it can do for people and the positivity it can bring you and how like metalheads are generally the loveliest people you'll meet. So like, I just really wanted to do a show because I kept wanting to tell people about listen to this though this is amazing you should listen yeah. to this and like unfortunately most people I know in real life aren't metalheads so I'd be like listen to this song yeah. by you know King Diamond about this possessed doll isn't this cool yeah. and then they'd be like 
yeah, I just don't like the sound of it. Like, it's a <laughs> right. cool idea, but they just don't like the sound, you know. Yeah, I'm not it's... saying they would go, oh, it's just noise, but like they just don't like how aggressive it is. Right. Um, so having a radio show is allowing me to tell people to listen to this cool song yeah, just right. on a massive scale, basically. And also it's allowed me to interview um, amazing, uh, you know, artists that I'm a huge fan of. Um, wow, because, that's cool. You know, like, I mean, the biggest band I've probably interviewed is like Anthrax, who a lot of people have heard, an yeah, heard of Anthrax, yep. you know. Um, so, yeah, like I was doing it just off my own back, never really interacting with record labels um, for a year. And then I would just tagged a bunch of artists in I'd played and Nuclear Blast, who are my favorite record label. The guy there, Nick, got in touch with me and said, hey, I, uh, I saw thank you for playing uh, Children of Bodom. Um, can I put you on a mailing list? We'll just send you free music. You might be able to, you know, interview opportunities. Do you want to go and see nice. Slayer? I was like, oh, cool. Yes, please. Yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. And so I didn't realize like a little small shrimpy boy like me, small fry radio show could like interview these amazing artists who I love and get yeah. free music and stuff. So then I was like, oh, I'm going to reach out to loads more record labels now. Yeah. yeah. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I work with, you know, I play nuclear blast artists because then what they're going to do is they're going to go, oh, nuclear blast. That's they're right. Oh, we got it. Yep. Yeah. We better send yep. you my music. So, nice. yeah. So, um, yeah, I just work. And now I have way too many records. I don't know. My email address has been put passed around it seems <laughs> yeah and now i get record labels just sending me promotional stuff that i have never i've never heard of it i've not asked for it and mostly i don't open the emails yeah, yeah. There's, there's so much stuff and i'm incredibly namist it turns out so if a band <laughs> has a name like megadeth i'm going to open it yes mm -hmm. that's a cool name right but if a band has a name like uh you know uh long drive yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no, nah, that's nope. instant. No, that's been yep. that sounds quite middle of the road. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't open a lot of emails <laughs> that I just delete, which is a shame, but I, I ain't getting paid for that. I right. mean, yep. I do get I get donations from my listeners who do give me a bit of an income from that. Yeah. However, and I'm very, very thankful, and it's very, very generous of them to do so. However, that's not coming from the record labels, yeah. So right. or or the re or the radio station. So my loyalty is to presenting uh, to the listeners something that will entertain yeah. them. My loyalty is not necessarily to um, yeah. the record labels. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's that's the radio show. I love it. It's it's the highlight of my week often. That's that's awesome. That like I I love that you know, there's just a whole community for that. And there's mm -hmm. like a, a place where everybody can kind of, uh, I'm sure there's like a metal Twitter or something where everybody yeah. kind of talks to there. Um, yeah, I was definitely one of the people that, uh, you know, my, my old roommate would constantly show me uh, metal music. He'd come in and be like, hey, like, check out this song. Like, doesn't this sound great? And I'm like, man, I am so, so, so happy that you like that song. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I'm like, I'm just like, I, I just can't like wrap my head around it, but he was so excited about it. And so like genuinely yeah. enthusiastic. I, I never felt like I could be like, you know, that music sucks or anything. Cause I, I don't think that, but like, for me, it's just like not my type of music. So I definitely mm -hmm. understand the like, hey check this out like and it's like that's a great yeah. idea but um yeah, i think it's I, because you're brought up listening to like yeah radio pop yeah. stuff and then you're For like sure. dragon music yeah. oh my god yeah, yeah. exactly yeah it, but i i did go to my first uh metal show uh mm -hmm. last year i think i i sent you some videos and stuff of that right oh yeah of yeah, me yeah, at yeah my first metal show uh, and so, yeah, my, my roommate had taken me to that. Um, and some of the music I, I was into, uh, but mostly the people there were so cool. Like all of the, all of the people there were so like way nicer than I thought they would be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Have I, you... I find, I think like with metal heads, the more extreme the metal as well, the more niche, I think the friendlier the people, um, because, um, 
they are people who go to shows all the time. They yeah. know show etiquette, like gig etiquette. They are, they're like, they, they don't encounter in the office people who also like, um, I'm trying to think of a really niche band now. I don't know. Well, not particularly niche, but like Ice Nine Kills. Uh, you know, they don't encounter people like that, but something yeah. they're extremely passionate about. So right. when you're at a show and you all know that you all love this yeah. band, otherwise yeah. you wouldn't be there. You're all pals. Like, That's a good point. Yeah. you know, uh, and like you're all super. I don't know why, but I think it's because and they're super considerate. And super lovely metalheads. And I think that's because metalheads are traditionally kind of outcasts from society yeah. as well. That's maybe a bit too of a dramatic term, but like, you know, it's not like we've suffered uh the 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 you know systematic racism or anything like that. Sure. But you're all, you know, you might be a weirdo or you might have been bullied or whatever. And part of the appeal of heavy metal is it's extremely empowering and it makes yeah. you feel strong and it, it gives you courage. Yeah. And so um, I feel like because and also like it's very cathartic with the more aggressive extreme stuff, because when you have a mental health difficulty like myself with my depression, if you have like someone, you know, externalizing that and making music that um, yeah. reflects that, um, that's that's why you're attracted to it. But but that's which means people often with like who have been bullied or mental health issues are there because they've been through that they're very considerate and they don't want other people to go through it because they've experienced that pain for themselves or, or that isolation for themselves so i think they're just like super nice people as well because they are the people who've been treated badly and they know what it feels like which is why you'll get lovely people at metal concerts whereas when i went to acdc in like um manchester arena <laughs> because that's you know i fucking love acdc but that everyone loves ACDC. Yeah. Right. So like you you got like such a, a huge amount of people there and such a cross section of society. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't people who go and search, you know, and go to these little clubs and right. like behave themselves properly because yep. they go there all the time. It right. was like, you know, middle aged men late middle-aged men's one gig of the year yeah so they had been like in the pub all morning getting hammered right. and then like going into the stadium pissed and being an absolute nuisance because yeah. they just don't know like yeah. they were you know just hammered and like staggering into me and my friend and it's like they just don't know how to behave themselves because they go to one gig every yep. year or two and then they just go absolutely mental right um, so yeah, I think the niche of the artist generally, the niche of the rock artist, and I class metal as a subgenre of rock. Yeah. And the nicer the people. I'm sorry, I've gone totally off. No, on no, no heavy this metal. is yeah, super interesting. That's <laughs> yeah. I I haven't thought of I haven't really thought of of something like that in, in the way that you just stated. So I yeah. I think that's super super cool. I, yeah. I, I, I want to, like, what kind of music did your friend make you try and listen to, Spencer? I want to know. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know any of the, I don't did know it, any of the names of the bands, but it was like, it was like just screaming nonstop. Right. Like, rah. okay. Yeah. So I would love to send you some music by a band okay. called Warfront. No, wait. Are they called Warfront? Crap, I've got a t-shirt with them on. Wind, <laughs> Windrose, right? Which is not that. It's super melodic. It's dwarven metal. They sing about <laughs> okay. dwarves. And oh, it's that really sounds fun sweet. And good natured. <laughs> and they have a lot of layered vocals. And they're, okay. you know, it's very quite operatic. And they sing stories about dwarves. Oh, and yeah. From send it over. I want to listen. Yeah, I will do. Yeah. I'll send you both it. It's one of my favorite albums of last year, Warfront. And they sing okay. about like Lord of the Rings dwarves and they sing about Warhammer dwarves, sing about all kinds of, you know, traditional <laughs> old fashioned dwar, you know, yeah. folktale dwarves, all the dwarves basically. And they're really good fun live. <laughs> That's I think awesome. you might like, awesome. I want to try you on that. Yeah. Just to see if, if you're into that. Yeah, for sure. Cause I, I don't mind like, um, like, have you listened to like, we came as Romans or like bear yeah. tooth? Mm -hmm, um, yeah. So I, I don't mind like the as long as it's got like singing and then if it gets to a heavy part where they kind of like scream for a minute, I don't mind that really. Sure. 
Um, and th- there's a lot of those songs that I, I really like from both those bands. Mm-hmm. Um, or uh, for what is it? Four years strong. Is that is see is that, that kind of stuff is generally maybe sometimes a bit too heavy for my liking. So like oh. when you hear like uh, Windrows, it's going to seem like probably like just pop music compared to uh, Beartooth. Oh, okay. You know, I like a few Beartooth songs, but yeah. I don't really go into the death metal section. I listen to power metal, which is very cheesy, very melodic dragon music. So <laughs> you, you might like that subgenre. Okay. Okay, that's cool. awesome. Yeah, I, I, I figured that all metal was was screaming and no, yeah, there's no. probably tons of of little subgenres in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the, with the death metal vocals, that whoa, kind of like voice. Yeah, the way I get into it is through the narrative of the song. So I used to hate that, but then there's a song called Twilight of the Thunder God by Amon Amarth from the album of the same name, and they seem like tough macho guys right from sweden but a yeah. uh, massive be- longest beards huge dudes like yeah. but they are called a monomath which is like the i can't remember what language but it's like one of the words for mount doom in uh, the lord of the rings so you know oh, everyone okay. and so they do this song called twilight of the thunder god which is about um ragnarok and about thor fighting jormungandr the yeah. uh, world serpent and so and the guy sings like that. And so I was like, well, if you're going to do a song about that, isn't that the most appropriate voice? To yeah. Have? Like, isn't yeah. that the correct, the most, you know, if you're going to pick a voice to sing about that, that's yeah. probably the right choice there. And then I got <laughs> into like, if you're listening to the lyrics and going, yeah, this is about like the end of the world. Thor fighting the biggest serpent ever in the ocean while the Fenris wolves tear the planet apart. Singing like that's probably accurate. Yes. Right. To, to what that, that should sound like. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Have you, um, I, I know it's like a total uh, tonal shift in music, but have you listened to much Wolf, Wolf Mother? Yes. Yeah, I do. I, I, ha- I have. Uh, yeah. I quite like them. They're quite old school sounding. Yeah, they almost sound like a like a Led Zeppelin or mm-hmm. something They're around that They're quite Black era. Sabbath. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I especially that first album, just like the self-titled Wolf Mother album. Mm. Uh, man, that is that is easily one of my favorite albums of all time. I could listen to that whole album front to back all the time, and uh, and they do a lot of that singing about like. Uh, there's one song I like something about like hidden in the forest of gnomes or something. Um, <laughs> I love it. And it's, they, they do a bunch of, a bunch of songs about fantasy stuff. And yeah, uh, it's, it's really awesome. And they just sound so good. Like they sound like they fit right in the, you know, what would that be like seventies or something? Yeah, I, I would just call that like traditional heavy metal. Oh really? Okay. Tales from the Forest of Gnomes. That's Tales the one. from the Forest of Gnomes. It's yeah. such a good song. It's yeah. such a good song. Uh huh. <laughs> it's great. It's great. Also, like I love, you know, like with the fantasy stuff, I love how unashamed of being so nerdy yeah. it is. Like yeah. they, they like that. That I remember when that album came out and that got in the charts, right in the UK at least in the mainstream tar- charts, and uh, and like they straight up have a song called tales from the forest of gnomes can you believe that <laughs> yeah like can you imagine like the the massive balls they must have to be like yeah song about gnomes mate what are you gonna do yep. about it yeah we are serious musicians this is our gnome song <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah that's awesome i that's love fantastic. it it's so great yeah um gabe i i don't think i know this what what kind of music do you listen to or do you listen to much music i don't listen to a ton of music when i do um i like country music okay yeah. so i listen to some country there's there's some older rap that i like as well not mm-hmm. not so much anymore i think i'm the newer partially... stuff sucks <laughs> yeah the newer stuff is rough exactly <laughs> like I, I listen to some older tech nine every once in a while and, and stuff like that um, I did go through. Isn't that uh, funny that that's old now? 
Yeah. Like yeah. that blows my mind that yep. Tech Nine is old. I know. Now. Oh my is God. it? Because <laughs> I know nothing about rap. And so to me, Tech Nine is a new artist. Yeah, no. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Tech sure, Nine's yeah. like an OG original rapper. Like back when when Eminem first got started, he uh -huh. was even before that, you know, 20 years ago. Oh, he was, was he? I thought he came out after Eminem. I think he was before that. And, and the dude's like 45 now and still rapping or so, you know, oh, something wow. like that, which is kind of cool. But yeah. Yeah, and then I, I went through, when I was in high school, I did go through metal phase. I listened to a lot of, like, Slipknot, kind of the, the Scream, Screamo stuff, mm -hmm. which I, I enjoyed. Um, but, yeah, mostly just for me, it's audiobooks. If I'm, like, driving in the car, <laughs> audiobook. If I'm, like, working, audiobook. Uh, um, yeah, I, I feel like I used to listen to a lot more music. And then ever since we started the podcast, yeah. it's just been, like, I'll just put on an audiobook. And, yep. Like, mm -hmm. I... But I, I do have to admit something. I don't even know if you guys will will know what this is. I have had uh, Good For You by Olivia Rodrigo stuck in my head <laughs> for like a week now. It's like a very, very like Taylor Swift poppy <laughs> song. Um, and I'll have to listen yeah. to it. Yeah, it, dude, it's so like, I, I don't know, RJ. It'll get stuck in your head. And you, <laughs> after a while, after a while, you'll be like, can I have any other song in my head <laughs> it's really good it's really like really catchy uh way way too catchy it's it's yeah. a weapon it's a weapon um, i think i've yeah, yeah i'm used to that because re i need something else to replace the tiktok songs that i keep hearing because yeah every time i open tiktok it's someone doing a, the dance that wednesday adams does oh and, yeah and have you uh, seen this game i'm sure i have it's like the well, I don't know. It's just it's very you, cool dancing. It sometimes, yeah, I like it a lot. Yeah, but it's it, it, on TikTok. It's set to like a sped up Lady Gaga song, whereas it went in the TV viral. Show, yeah. yeah, yeah, and so I can't get that sped up Lady Gaga <laughs> song out of my head. Yeah. Like, so I, I I welcome this other Olivia. <laughs> what do you call it, Rodriguez? Uh, uh, Olivia Olivia Rodrigo, and it's called Good for You. Yeah, I will happily take that to replace. <laughs> I think it's Bloody Mary or whatever it's called by Lady Gaga, but sped yeah. up. Yeah, I, I feel like I used to be into, and I, I still am, I guess, but I used to be into a lot more um, like singer, songwriter, like acoustic, like just guy mm -hmm. and his guitar kind of music. Um, and I, I, I still really like that because there, there's actually a lot of that on um, one of our favorite shows, uh, Sex Education. Mm. And there, there's a lot of good music in that show. Yeah. So I, I do like that stuff, but for some reason in the past few years, I don't know if like this is just part of getting old or like if I'm just not like clued <laughs> in to like what the good music is anymore, but mm. I've just been listening to all the pop songs, just like all of the top 40 radio kind of it's kinda good. Stuff. It's and, good. And... Re refresher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I've just been like. You know, and, and, and for a while, I had no way of playing music in my car other than the radio. So I think that's kind of when yeah. it started. And I was like, oh, a lot of this is really catchy. And uh, and then from there, it's just like I'm the biggest secret fan of Taylor Swift. Like <laughs> yeah. and and, yeah. The, and like Halsey and stuff like I love yeah, Halsey, Halsey. Halsey's stuff great. like that. And yeah. I, I think, you know, I, I think there's the kind of the mainstream pop the stuff that like tires you out right like you're oh, like yeah. oh this is the same thing over and over again <laughs> oh yeah and then halsey comes in and like actually has like very meaningful music that i yeah. love i mm -hmm. went and saw her in concert like a couple months ago rj it was the best show i've ever been to awesome oh yeah, yeah. about that yeah it was amazing yeah like i i get from some pop music what i get from heavy metal yeah like, it's extremely and like i lo i i love a band you might not have had them over there called girls aloud right and it was just uh, like high energy power pop yes like, oh, okay uh, it was like just like drinking loads of energy drinks and <laughs> nice loads of sugar heck yeah and like that's the same feeling i get from heavy metal as well when it's like really fast and just makes me go woo yeah uh, yeah so yeah i i i have received similar you know i i enjoy going down a pop route now and then yeah. i've been I, I like I like Kesha's older albums. I, like I just really enjoy it. I look, but they're quite subversive. Like Girls Aloud and Kesha could be quite subversive. So I enjoyed the fact that like they were very mainstream at the, to begin with and marketed for kids, but right. they were saying quite like 
subversive and often filthy things. Right. Yeah, I enjoyed right. that kind of like yeah. subversion of, of everything. Can you believe that? I mean, I guess it would have been around the time that Gabe and I were in like early high school that mm. Kesha was putting out these music videos and just music that everybody was listening to talking about giving blowjobs and getting, <laughs> getting fucked in the back of a club and all this stuff. I'm like, dude, I can't believe they allowed that on the radio. <laughs> that, I love transgressive <laughs> stuff. I absolutely love it. I love it. It's so great. Yeah. It's just I, so naughty. But yeah. not yep. like, I don't mean like sexy. I mean, it is naughty, sexy, naughty. But yeah. I just love that kind of like naughty kind yep. of like just sneaking filth onto yes. the airway. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's fantastic. And, and I love how uh, nowadays, now that Spotify is the thing, I, I feel like it used to be when I was in high school where like one of your friends was like the friend who knew all the cool music and like mm -hmm. they would make you a mix CD or you'd go over to their house and you'd load a bunch of their songs onto your iPod or right, yeah. Zune for me. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I feel like that was kind of the norm. And now we have Spotify where you can find, you can start with a specific song that you like and then just let it go and yeah. it will find you a hundred other songs that sound similar. Yeah. And dude, I love that. Like whenever I love going down, I don't do it very often, but I love going down Spotify rabbit holes where I'll have like a very kind of niche song that I like and just let it go from there. And there's so many songs where I've been like, Oh, I like that. I'm going to check out this band and I'll yep. favorite it. And now I just have like this big list of songs that I would have never known about. Yeah. It's yeah, such me a too. Cool feature. Yeah, absolutely. There's also got your specialized playlists on there, like uh, your release radar playlist, which it, it makes for you automatically of like new songs by artists you already follow or that it thinks you might like. Mm. And then there's your discovery playlist or discover something which like basically is all music you've not heard before, but like it sounds similar to what you've yeah. told Spotify you That's enjoy. Cool. Right. Yeah, absolutely brilliant stuff. Yeah. Good old yeah. algorithm right there. Yeah, that's, love it. that's the algorithm yep. at work. And as much as I hate it, YouTube's algorithm works really well too. Yes. Like, oh my, dude, I, mm -hmm. so Gabe convinced me, uh, it's probably been like six months now. He convinced me to get YouTube premium. YouTube, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, I had never had it before. And of course, it like cancels out all the ads and stuff. So you can just click on something and watch it. And oh my God, will I go down a YouTube rabbit <laughs> yeah. hole? Like, and, and, and the things that it suggests to me are so accurate. Like I, I don't understand how it is so accurate. Yeah. And like ev almost every video that shows up on my homepage, I'm like, yes, I want to watch that. That's and right. Four hours later, I'm, you know, <laughs> watching, uh, watching a video about. Uh, do dogs understand kisses? And... <laughs> you know, I've been looking at like writing tips and stuff. Yeah. And so like before it was just all Warhammer and like miniature wargaming stuff, like crafting stuff. Um, and uh, now it's just feeding me loads of good like writing advice. It's absolutely nice. brilliant. Oh, yeah, nice. I love that. And and yeah, it, it changes. It responds really quickly. Yes. Like, I, yeah. I, it's so useful to me. Like I know like people say a lot of YouTube creators say it's basically an extremely harsh master, the algorithm, but as a user, it does serve you very well. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll admit though, there has been times where, where it, it changes a little too fast. I, for me, I think, cause like there was a couple times where I looked up, um, I'm like, Oh, I just want to see somebody like rant about this subject or rant about this book for a second. And mm -hmm. I look at that video and then my entire homepage is just people with like rant videos and negativity. So <laughs> I'm like, like, okay, I didn't, I just wanted to, you know, release a little bit of steam here. I didn't want to get yeah. the whole negative, negative thing going on. <laughs> but, but yeah, for the most part, I think, I think it works really, really well. And matter, it's a little scary too. There's been times where I'm like, I know for a fact 
that I have not searched anything about this or yeah. anything like that, but I've talked about it with people and all of a sudden it's popping up on my, on my feed. I'm like, dude, our, <laughs> our, our phones are listening to us. I'm sure it's somewhere in the user agreement that we all sign without looking at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've got adverts for me. I'm like, yeah. Why have you, how did you know I was thinking about this to yep. send me this very specific niche advert? How frightening. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's scary. And then we got all these people. Oh, we'll talk about this in a little bit too. But we got, um, we got all these people feeding the AI right now. And so that, that can't possibly be helping. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're all doing the AI art, now AI writing, and it's wild. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I make AI art I have to say I don't use it for um like I don't try and sell it or anything yeah. but it's such a addictive and and fun I, toy I to know use. how do you so is is there just a website that you use or is there a service that you paid for or? uh no it's I get there's free apps like I use starry AI uh the best one apparently like I'm in a, a Facebook group um but uh the best one it looks like it's called um, Mid Journey, um, but all of my free credits on that, you, you don't get free credits on that. So I, I used up all my trial credits and then oh. you have to pay for it. And oh, I probably okay. would pay for it if I made all the money in the world. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's That's a lot of cool. fun. It's huge amounts of fun. Yeah. 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 I've, I've never really toyed with it that much on my phone. I, I really like, I'm, I like really hate the AI stuff. Um, but it does it. I can understand how it's like a ton of fun. And like mm -hmm. my, my roommate used to do that. He would like, you could even like upload pictures of something. So he, yeah. he, he uploaded a picture of my dog oh. and typed in motorcycle next to it. And the next thing we know, he's got this picture of my dog flying in the air and the back, <laughs> the, the back half of him is a motorcycle that's awesome. so he's got like a wheel on the back of him it was it was pretty sweet yeah you can't you know like why it's amazing like yep. it's i agree amazing like i i just i just like to use it to make the most absurd yeah weird things possible like i just the other day made a picture of margaret thatcher kissing another margaret thatcher in the street <laughs> and it's like it's so good like it's so oh much fun God. to just realize you're just insane thoughts that you yeah. have sometimes this uh this is how the terminators get us like this is how yeah. it starts <laughs> uh -huh. is we're, we're all like oh yeah robots are super fun and then they just <laughs> take over our lives yeah yeah <laughs> although i a friend of mine who's a very good narrator um fiona thrail she put on Facebook about how wouldn't it be interesting, you know, art, you know, there's a lot of controversy at the moment yeah. about AI art and whether or not it's stealing art and, and or not. Um, yeah. And uh, and she was saying it's really, you know, that aside, wouldn't it be interesting if we get to a level where, you know, we as humans use art to um, explore what it means to be human? Wow. Wouldn't it be incredible if we get to the point where a machine is able to use art to explore what it means to be a machine and it can use art to exp like yeah. to com communicate with humans about what the machine experience is like? Like that is like that'd be amazing. Then we're really in sci-fi land. Dude, you you should read uh you should read the scythe books. Have have yeah. you heard of these? Wait, what the no i haven't wait but, no no i haven't they're they're by neil schusterman and it's about yeah. um we it's about it's on earth and we get to a point in technology where we have this ai basically what is now the cloud turns yeah. into like this big ai mm -hmm. and it can do everything for humans it can you know there's there's no there's no death, really. There's no food shortages. There's nothing. Uh, yeah. the, on the only problem is overpopulation. And so the main uh, kind of, um, not antagonist, but like the, the main like crux of the series is about these scythes 
who, um, because overpopulation is going to become a thing if people don't die, yeah, you know, they kind of randomly select these these people to die in uh, natural and unnatural ways. Mm. Um, but most people are living for like thousands of years, <clears throat> and so um, the AI, uh, the the whole point of that was the AI is kind of this thing that interacts with humans on a daily basis and has the entire like stored knowledge of all of humanity. And so it kind of, it it tries to explore what it means to be human through Mm. that. Um, And it's constantly talking to people and they're asking questions about it. And there's one character in particular that has a really close relationship with this AI. It's called the Thunderhead. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's one human in particular that has like a really close bond with the Thunderhead. Um, and it's it's really fascinating, dude. It's it's there's some like mind-bending stuff about how all of that kind of stuff just compounds on itself and gets bigger and bigger and more exploratory i think you'd really like it I, uh yeah i've just made a note of it just then to uh to look nice. it up. sounds great yeah 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 i think you'd love it very cool book covers as well yeah yes. and, and the the audiobooks are phenomenal the yeah. audiobooks are really really good yeah nice nice i'll <laughs> i'll check it out thanks yeah so i i do kind of want to talk some more about these uh content creation questions mm-hmm. um God, the the chapters on YouTube for this one are going to be a mess, <laughs> but I love it. We've had such a great conversation. Yeah. I I wouldn't change it for anything. So I I do have a question here. You have such a fantastic recording studio that you've made like in your backyard, right? And mm-hmm. yeah, and all of your audio sounds so good. And, and I've kind of you know we've been doing this for a couple years now and i'm starting to get to the point where i'm like you know i i kind of want to up my sound in these youtube videos i'm thinking about turning my closet kind of into my you know recording studio for just like youtube videos and maybe for the podcast and so i'm thinking you know i i i kind of want to get some some insulation in here so that my voice isn't so bouncy in some of these videos um, sure. and, and I'm sure a lot of other people out there are kind of wondering the same thing, like how can they make a good recording studio for the kinds of things that, that you do? So can you, uh, you know, you don't need to go into like extreme detail if you don't want to, but like kind of how is your studio set up? How did you get this thing uh, built and go in here? Yeah, it's it was an existing building in the house that we bought a few couple of years back, um, just under two years ago. It was like a garden. It was like a glorified shed, essentially, with heating okay. and stuff in it. And it looked for nice. It does look nice inside. Like, yeah, it looked it looked nicer then because I haven't covered it in <laughs> crap. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, it was. So it's like a, a building with an electric supply and it had nice nice varnished wood floors and stuff and so i saw that and i was like i would love that f- to be my home workspace yeah. studio um so it's big it's it's not big it'd be quite it's a it would be a massive shed like you go that's a really yeah. big shed okay um so i cut the root i essentially made a partition wall out of MD- mdf like yep. nothing special basically put got a massive wood thing delivered to my house okay. and then like screwed it into the floor using brackets and stuff um and then what i did was like insulation is very important yes i used to work in a um basically a glorified cupboard um previously okay. my old studio <laughs> and so there was it was good it was good and you know it was fine it sounded good but all you could have there was acoustic foam whereas i wanted something that was like a lot more deadening i was like well if i'm going to build a studio from scratch not just repurpose a room but like i'm making a room with this partition wall i'm gonna go all in on the budget that i have so what's better than um uh, acoustic foam panels you know it looks like egg boxes essentially is big thick acoustic panels that you can buy for like a lot of money Mm. Um, so I found out how to, uh, on YouTube, there was a tutorial about how to make it yourself. So, nice. um, I, I did that and that's what these are that you, you know, that 
if yeah. people watching on YouTube will be able to see. Um, it's basically a wooden frame, uh, we, which I measured out, you know, I drew on the wall where the wooden frames would go. So I, I knew how big they all needed to be. Yeah. Um, wooden frame. And then I went and bought loads and loads of rock wool sound insulation from B and Q, which is a, uh, a DIY it... chain here in the UK. Yeah. Okay. Like um, a home Depot or something. Yeah, yeah I guess okay. so. Yeah. Uh, and then I bought some garden fleece, which is the kind of like very thin white fleece mesh mm. material that you put over plants and crops to protect them from oh, yeah. cold yes. snaps. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, rock wool insulation. You don't want to be like breathing that in. So, right. yeah. Um, I covered the uh, rock wool insulation in, in this garden fleece and then inserted it into the frame. And then over the top of that, uh, to make it look nicer, um, I it's just burlap sack material. Um, okay. And I ordered loads and loads of that to the point where, like, the guy from the shop, uh, the fabric shop in Edinburgh was like, is this a mistake? I was like, <laughs> no. And then, and then on my next order, he was like, what are you after ring to find out what on earth you're building? <laughs> yeah. So I explained. Um, yeah. And then I basically just stuck them. You, I got hooks so I can take them off the oh, wall nice. um, and hung them around the room. Yeah. Uh, the, the curtain as well was probably the single most expensive item. That is a yes. sound dampening curtain. Yeah. Um, wow. And then I got a very thick pile rug um, for the floor. Okay. And um, put that on the floor to deal with any echoes and reflections coming from the floor um, up above there's more rock insulation that i put in between rock wall insulation i put between the rafters and then i covered the rafters over with fabric uh, to keep it all in there okay. um, and anywhere i couldn't like build a frame where it would be ridiculous where you know because wood is going to be s so thick that like yeah. it would just be two bits of wood next to each other yeah. um, i just used your you know old-fashioned traditional acoustic foam that i had left over from my last studio and i cut that to size where necessary and stuck that in all the corners where i was unable to uh add these big thick acoustic panels okay. so uh yeah if people want to go on my facebook page which is uh, rj bailey voice artist and sound designer and go to the video section i vlogged the creation of my studio and oh building. cool oh i'm gonna do that yeah that's i mean awesome. it's crap i'll warn you the videos are dreadful <laughs> like really amateurish garbage they're just waffling like i'm badly shot because the only camera i own is on my phone right it stills or for or video so i shot it on that but um it does kind of lay out the process there um and that's how i i, I made my studio and when it comes to recording environment is very important like yeah. people want to buy an extremely fancy microphone like you're better off you need a good microphone if you want good yeah. um sound but you're better off treating your um actual environment your surroundings to make sure that your noise levels are as controllable and as quiet as possible um, and it's conducive to uh, capturing good audio. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I like. I I had never thought about making sound mm -hmm. panels because I had always, I had always seen those. Uh, like you know, at a like you see pictures of like recording studios with like these big sound panels and yeah. stuff. Um, but that's a genius idea to make a frame and stuff it with a uh, rockwell insulation yeah that's, that's yeah. really cool i like yeah. that a lot it works so well um it's so much cheaper like i could not afford when i moved house to cover this studio this recording you know it's part you know it's bigger than a booth but smaller than a studio type thing yeah. i couldn't afford to cover that in very expensive uh pre-made ones but yeah. it's actually to make a single one is quite cheap. You just need some timber, uh, some insulation, some garden fleece, and then screws and a drill, like nails, yeah. <laughs> you know? Nice, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm mm. definitely gonna have to do something like that. And then my uh, my last real 
content creation here is what kind of programs do you use for your narrating work uh, and your podcast and how do they generally work? Like what is kind of your, your process while creating content? Yeah. Okay. So it's called a DAW, D-A-W for short, a digital audio workstation. That's j- just jargon talk for um, the, the recording software. Mm. Oh, okay. um, I use a program called Reaper, which is um, 60 bucks. If you're not like a mega corporation making tons of money, <laughs> um, it kind of, you can, if you're, if you're just using it for non-commercial use, you can get it for free. Like Uh-oh. just download it for free. No problem. Full version. Um, it's kind of like an honesty box type situation. Right. And if you are using it for commercial dust stuff, it's 60 bucks for your whole life. It's incredible. Oh, wow. Um, oh, nice. Loads of great plugins as well. You can do your mastering in there if you really want to. Um, I have a lot of tools set up. So when I'm recording, it's it applies these effects, which it centrally are automatically mastering as it records. Interesting. Um, mastering, okay. yeah. So what I do is I record into Reaper. That has certain plugins activated, which um, are the sound effects I mentioned. And sound effects not in the traditional yeah. sense of like a crash and a boom and a what have you, um, but like stuff like a, you know, like noise reduction, things like that, um, a noise gate. You know, a noise gate is controversial because many people will say you shouldn't use a noise. Some people will say, oh, you absolutely should never use a noise gate. I think those people don't know that you can alter the wet dry ratio. Um, I used to use a noise gate plenty. I've switched I've switched over to a compressor now. So so much so use it that I forgot I don't use the noise gate anymore. Mm. But um yeah, a compressor, like a downward expander, um, all these different things like sound effects. That's plugged in there. Um, I record into that. That's most of the work. Um, and then uh, I take it into another program, which I bought called Isotope RX7. RX8 is out. RX9 might even be out now. Uh, but they're not cheap programs. RX7 does absolutely the job I need it to. Uh, so I don't feel the need to um drop another 300 dollars yeah on something which i don't i can't you know this makes pristine audio so i don't need to spend that personally right um i think when people upgrade often there's this saying in audiobooks and voice acting it's i'm sure it's common in a lot of industries like this called you get gas which is gear acquisition syndrome where you're like or oh, oh, you get gas I for need, short yeah where, yeah, yeah I need exactly, that. Yep. you've got it. You've got it. Okay. <laughs> um, you got to have that. Like, yeah. you know, maybe you get it in carpentry or whatever, where you're like, I need this shiny new drill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Current drill is fine, my friend. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm fortunate, and I don't have gas. So <laughs> I put, um, I put, I record into Reaper. I export it as a WAV, which is a high quality um, audio audio file. file rather than MP3, which compresses it. Uh, and makes the quality oh. lesser. Um, they are you get much smaller files, so it's good. You could so you, you MP3s of music, you could fit a lot more MP3s on your MP3 player than you could WAVs, because WAVs are so much bigger, but the WAVs will technically sound a lot better, mm. supposedly. Oh. I don't know if if it's really if you really notice yeah. that much difference, depending what what you're listening to. Right. But, um, I get the WAV and then I put it into Isotope RX7. I run an automated process on that. And then I will manually go through and master everything as well, um, listening to it um, Jeez. Uh, and, and taking out extraneous sounds, which yeah. the automated stuff hasn't done. A lot right. of the time it's just babysitting and I'm yeah. just sat there like listening to an audiobook again yeah. um, that I've already recorded. Because if you can really dial in your settings, and you have a good recording studio like myself, yeah. there aren't going to be those weird noises unless yeah, you're a dumbass right. uh, like me sometimes and you drop something that you've been <laughs> fiddling with while you're narrating and you're going to go and take out the clung of that hitting the desk or something. Um, yeah, because I, I couldn't imagine like recording an entire audiobook and mm. then having to go like, dude, for me to edit like a three hour podcast, yeah. it, 
it it takes at least double that to edit. Uh -huh. and, and so like with all the tools that you have kind of doing it automatically, that must be really nice because then you're just, you're, you're interrupting that last round fewer times. Absolutely. Um, you know, you're just kind of listening through it and kind of jumping mm -hmm. in here and there where you need to. Yeah. Uh, that, that's really, really cool. Yeah. I, I should mention as well that there is a proofing stage. So if I'm making the audiobook entirely with, by myself, which I don't do so much nowadays, I um, I will record it. And before I'll put it into the mastering software, Isotope, I will proof it. So we go through the audiobook, proofing it, making sure what's going in, in your ears yep. is the same as what your eyes are seeing on the page. And any changes, you you record the change and you put it in there. Usually you're listening through on, on the recording software going along. So when you hit a problem, you just rewind it a little bit, you record over it with the correct thing and then you crack on go and keep going. Yeah, I've, I've seen you do that in your, in your live recordings. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's really cool how you can just be recording. And if there's a, a slip up, uh, yeah. I, I, I just hear you hit a couple buttons and then you just go back to whatever yeah. the last couple words or whatever were. I, I'm like, man, that's really, that's really that's cool. called punch and roll recording um, okay. because you punch in uh, your correction and then you just let it roll. I think that's where it comes from. It's called punch and roll. That okay. is like the standard now. Mm. I, I, it's so much more work not doing punch and roll yeah. what i used to do in the early days and i've got it suspended above me actually is as a like a reminder is i have a dog clicker for training your dog yep oh yeah you know that does that i hope that doesn't ruin yep. your microphone your yeah. audio no, um, so what you would do is when you got to a mistake because i used to work in a program called audacity which you might mm -hmm. be familiar i've with. heard yeah. yeah yeah um that now has punch and roll but that didn't have punch oh. and roll when I was working with the audacity years ago. So you would, when you make a mistake, that makes a very distinctive sound, like yeah. sound wave, very high spike that doesn't look like You're your talking, voice at yeah. all. Oh. So when you would listen back to it, proofing it, you would see coming this spike. So you would know there was a mistake there. Um, he, some people, I, I would listen through to it because I don't trust myself. However, uh -huh. what you could do is you would make a mistake, do that, and then or you wouldn't even have to listen to the audio. You could just scan through the audio, you know, drag it along because it's displayed as a track, one line, yeah, right. and look for these big spikes. And that's where you know there's a mistake is and you have to go and intervene. Um, so there is That's that stage. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. The proofing stage. And then once the proofing stage is done, you export it as a WAV. Um, and then you master it in um in Isotope uh RX7 okay. in my case. And what you do is you um make sure you turn it up to the volume it you need it to be uh before mastering. Because yeah. if you make if you keep it at a low volume i record at a low volume or low gain low input so that allows me to shout and not peak the microphone mm. so in dramatic sequences yeah. in horrifying you know if i need to scream in terror i can do that and it won't blow the sound yeah um, okay. and peak and i have to turn it up so what i to make it listenable so if for listeners ears and when you submit things to audible and stuff like that the volume, the consistent volume needs to be at a certain level. It needs to be loud enough generally, otherwise they'll reject it. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. So um, you turn it up once you've done your proofing and edited it, you know, make put it all together. Then you put it into your mastering software because if you master it with your automation processes, really quietly and then turn it up because you've put a quiet thing in your mastering software will not be able to hear i put in you know right. quotation marks not be able to hear the quiet issues so it won't take care of them it won't get rid of them and then if you turn it up after you've completed mastering it makes those things which weren't an issue 
an issue because it makes those things louder. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if you make it louder and then master it, it can hear these things at the volume that other humans would be listening to it. So then it's able to take care of them. Interesting. And then you export it and then you put it in another program. Uh, and then basically that renders it as uh, it, that encodes it. It's an encoder uh, called FreeAC or Freak, uh, which uh, makes it into a kind of file that Audible particularly likes. And that's it done. Wow. Nice. Wow. That's that's cool. All right. So throughout this process, are you are you sending like snippets of the book or like pro like rough drafts or anything to the author uh, to no for them to kind of no because that encourages micromanaging and, yeah. and oh, I, you know like any job like yep it, yeah once you get an author all my authors are great they're wonderful however. I have been micromanaged in other jobs before and I know I can imagine what a nightmare it is. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. like in, in, in audio and they're like giving you line readings and like, they might be like, can you say this line a bit different? Okay. You want to give them the full whack of the audio book because that helps them understand the as a full piece. Yeah. So they might hear, they might scrutinize 15 minutes, which is not really, you can't scrutinize yeah. 15, 19 hours of audio like you would scrutinize 15 minutes. Yeah. Because, right. you, you know, like yep. it's, it's, you've, it's to be profitable, it's got to get out by a certain, you're only allowed to spend a certain amount of time on it. Yeah. Um, so, what I do and what a lot of people do is they say to an author, like, I'm going to record you 15 minutes to begin with. And it's going to be the first 15 minutes of the book. Or what I do is I say, send me pages that you think are important. Yeah. That you need to hear later on in the book. Say if certain characters don't appear in the first 15 minutes, then if you want to hear those characters, certain things you want to hear, right. let me no, send me those pages. I'm going to record you 15 minutes and then you can have input on that. And then, you know, we'll discuss the tone, uh, the speed of my reading, uh, certain character voices, stuff like that. And That's then after that, yeah. And then after that, the doors are closed. Uh, that That yeah. is your time to inter intervene, the author's time or the, the publisher's time to interve gotcha. intervene with my recording. And then after that, it's it's all me until the end. Right. Because I'm like, the way I view it is it's kind of like an adaptation of the, the book. In right. the same way, the writer of a book, when it's being turned into a film, they are, the director is in control of that. Yeah. And I'm the film director, in quote marks, of the audio adaptation. So right. I will absolutely do my best to render what they had in their heads. Yeah. Um, but also, ultimately, I will have creative control of the audio book because I'm the audio book expert. That's yep. why they right. hired me. And yep. I know how certain things work in uh, audio and what works best for audio. Whereas they know what works the best on the written page. Yeah. Right. Unfortunately, and that sounds arrogant to say. No, uh, uh, no I think uh, it makes um, total sense. That's, I, I uh, would yeah. say I would say the same thing as a carpenter. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like, and so like, I don't want to piss people off and go like, you no, know, this is my project now. It's not sure. that at all. Where yeah. you know that is way off the mark. But I am the expert. So if they want me to do a voice in a in a particular way like this yeah. and it's a main character i appreciate that but that is unsustainable yeah um for this book and then if there's sequels that's just going to ruin my voice i yeah. can't be done and i also know that that's going to be very not while fun they, while for it, the reader yeah exactly yeah. like while it's supposed to be an unpleasant voice there is a balance to strike with what yeah portraying a voice as unpleasant to listen to and it actually being really difficult and grating yeah. so you don't want to go back to the audiobook and yeah. finish the story um so yeah. yeah that that i kind of like feel i'm like 
the film director. I have a welcome right. packet, and I like I'm directing this, and you're the writer. Yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah, there's there's a book that I'm I'm reading right now that I I really like, and I think you would like, especially the audio book. It's called The mm-hmm. Vagrant, and it, I've kind of described it as The Mandalorian meets Cormac McCarthy's The Road meets Fallout. Wow. Um, and it's really, really good. I'm really enjoying it. And I think that the, the audiobook narrator, uh, he actually reminds me a lot of you. I, I think, I think that, and I'm not just kissing ass here, but I, <laughs> I think that you're better than him, but you can Aww. tell, you can tell that he like really wants to like be in the characters and he has like really distinct voices for all of them. And you can tell that he, that he's like really into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, that's what I, I like about him. But there's this one thing, there's this, uh, there's kind of like these demons or monsters or something that have kind of inhabited the land. And every now and then you'll kind of hear them like whispering to the protagonist. And it's just the most god awful voice. Like all of his <laughs> other voices are fantastic, but, yeah. you know, it, it was just a bad choice for that one that one type of voice and it would be fine if they went on for like you know 15 30 seconds whatever but sometimes they go on for like two minutes or three minutes and Mm. as as a reader it's like yeah like that would be a good voice for like a quick like you know demon voice or something but as as the reader listening to that for two minutes it's not fun (laughs) yeah Yeah. I i can understand that I, I can't comment because I've not heard it, but yeah, sure. I, I totally get that. Like, yeah. there's a character in, I know, like, one of your absolute favorite books, probably ever, The 13th Hour, uh, with, uh, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> as you know, I, I uh, narrated that, and um, there is a, there's a character who's quite robotic in it, yeah. to, right at the end. Um, okay. And, uh, and, and time based. And so I actually started narrating it. I had this high concept for it that was like, I'm going to speak on the second, every second. So I will speak a syllable because once a second, like, and that oh, ties okay. in with the time thing, which is fucking great idea in my head. Right. Well, I was like two sentences in, I was like, this takes me forever yeah. to say it. <laughs> this is going to be so irritating for the listener so uh, I, I just went with a more conventional but robotic kind of voice right. so yeah yeah i i do get that there is a balance to strike and that's what i'm talking about it's like yeah. a, an author or a publisher may want you to do a crazy out there voice but sometimes you're like this is just gonna be yep. tedious can't mate. do you it can't. yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah nice yeah. idea yeah in theory it's hard practice. to implement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and Gabe, what he's talking about with the the thirteenth hour. I don't, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, after we did our the the podcast we did at your house, after we put that up, I put up my worst books of twenty twenty two, and it's actually, dude, it's doing like bigger numbers than our usual podcast yeah. i think people people like to see the hot takes and they like to see some of the negatives sometimes yep. and i i try not to do that a lot because i mm. am i am prone to going on a rant <laughs> um, but uh people are really liking that one but i felt so bad because um one of the books that i i just really did not like from 2022 was the 13th hour which rj narrated and and he's he's a fan of the book too and so i was like oh man i feel bad for putting this in here and he and and i talked later i'm like i'm sorry it wasn't you i just didn't like it i'm sorry (laughs) that is the thing that you don't need to be sorry because yeah yeah you are a reviewer it's your job to give an honest opinion right as much as it is a writer's job to write the best book they can yep. and a narrator's job to do the best performance they can it is a reviewer's job to give the most accurate review yeah. they can yeah. of how they feel you know it, it, it it's disingenuous and it it undermines any credibility you have if you're just 
super nice and pleasant yeah. about anything. So, right. you know, and also like another YouTuber um, said, booktuber said it was like their favorite book of the yeah, year. Yeah, everybody's different too. Everybody has so, different yeah, tastes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it, you know, it's fine. Yeah. Like there's no need, because I used to review stuff for a magazine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and websites and stuff. And so I felt the same of being like, I'm really sorry, but I thought it was bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for sure. Well, I, I appreciate that. Okay, so we'll go into like, I know we've already gone off topic and stuff, but we'll go into our real off topic section. And I, I have one question that I really want to make sure that I ask. But other than that, after that, I'll I'll hand it over to Gabe so that he can bring in some topics and stuff. I, I feel like I've been steamrolling over you. I'm sorry. No, you're good, man. I'm, I'm happy. Okay. So <laughs> RJ, you have this thing on Twitter and mm -hmm. I, I cannot figure out if it's a joke or if it's real. And this is your massive list of SFF names. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, you're like, I'm, I made this list for, for authors in case anybody wants to use these names. Mm -hmm. And like some of them I think are really funny. And then some of them I think are like really normal. And so I'm like, I don't know if this is a troll or not. And I just, I have to know. <laughs> um, I mean, some would say the, the best, <laughs> The best trolls are the ones where you're not sure if yeah. it's a troll or not. <laughs> yeah. um, it's if you know, it's it's up to the it's I believe the in death of the author, yeah. Uh it's up to the reader to decide if this is just nonsense or if these are really good names that it's just as a little way of giving back to the SFF or authors who have provided my income for so many years. Yeah. You know, that's so fantastic. They, if they want to have a character called Terry Bimbag, then, <laughs> then I am I'm only flattered that they have used it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. OK, yeah, I just I had to ask. That's been it's been so funny for so long now and I'll forget about it. And then like six months or like, you know, whatever, two months down the road. Uh huh. I'll see it pop up again. I'm like, oh yeah, RJ has this list. It's like hun it's like hundreds of names, like at probably. this point. Like it, probably there, there is so many. It's this massive, massive list. And yeah. I, I just I just picture anytime some fantasy or sci-fi name pops into your head, but add it to the list. Get it on the <laughs> list, mate. I just <laughs> Why? I mean, I can't use them. I'm not an author, so yeah. pop them on the list. Let someone else <laughs> have access to this amazing resource. Yeah. That's, you know, that's like, fantastic. why should a name like Gary Screenshots go to waste? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Oh, it's so good. I, I get endless enjoyment out of that. Good, every, every, every time it pops up, I'll just like click on whatever the newest one is and just read like the last <laughs> like 10 or 15. I'm like, this is fantastic, man. This is so great. Good. I'm glad you enjoy them. <laughs> yeah. It's because I, I moved house and uh, as I've already mentioned on this show, and um, it was quite a botched house move due to like our sellers be uh, sorry. Yeah, the people buying the house from us being really bad and not getting their stuff together quickly enough. So like I was kind of like we stayed in my brother-in-law's flat. He very kindly let us stay there while he was away on holiday. But I didn't have access to a bunch of stuff uh, that I usually do. So I just started going crazy. Yeah. And then like or like literally just these words uh came into my head. And then I was like, that could be a name in a sci-fi yeah. novel or something. Yeah. Like that. So yeah, that and and then it's just carried on, and and that's where the list. It, that's that's why the list comes from the fantasy and sci-fi names. That's that's so great. I I love that so much. I'm pleased to enjoy <laughs> it. <laughs> I'm trying to find find that list right now. I'm not logged into the. I could. Uh, oh, let me... Ignatius Stooge. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Diabolical Wi-Fi. Yep, Masmer. Hogue? Hogue? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sir, Sir Humphrey Sarge. Particle. 
<laughs> did you did you send him the list? No, I just googled found it. it. Oh, okay. <laughs> what did you Google? I RJ <laughs> Bailey SFF names first thing that popped up. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, amazing. That's so great. Emperor yeah. Padalon Concertrex. Uh, Padalon <laughs> Concertrex is because I was watching um, Game of Thrones. No. House of the Dragon, and so that is a science fiction version of Paddy Considine's name. Oh, nice. Oh, okay, nice. Fluge hey. Ab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it, I love it. Yeah, it's so fantastic. You, you've got to finish House of the Dragon, Gabe. Are you, yeah. still, are you still on episode four? Um, I think so. It's been a little while since we've done it, but yes, I think, <laughs> I think that's correct. Yeah, yeah. What did you think of it, RJ? I loved House- it. Yeah, absolutely loved it. I thought it was, you know, just what I wanted from a continuation of the Game of Thrones franchise. Yeah. What about you guys? Do you both like it? I I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. The, so far, so far, I like it a lot. Yeah. I I dude, I was so happy when Gabe texted me and he was like, "We just started House of the Dragon. We're like two or three episodes in." I was like. <laughs> this is what I've been waiting for. <laughs> oh, and then I sent him sent him a message later. I was like, "Is are, are is there supposed to be incest in this show?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's like, "Yes, that's what yeah. they're known for." Yeah. I was like, oh, okay. I missed that. Yeah. Did you watch that- Game of Thrones, Gabe? I did. I no, no. I've uh, seen like stuff here and there, but incest I have not- is par for the course. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. That, and that's what Spencer said too. He's like, "That's yeah. just kind of." That's what they do. Yeah. 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 It it was funny because he was talking. uh, I I, I can't remember if it was in the group chat or if it was just me and him, but he was talking about how um, him and his girlfriend were watching it. And they weren't you guys like arguing about whether uh, Damon and Rhaenyra were an item? No. So, so whether they would, (laughs) because I was like, no, no way. Like, this is when he's bringing her to the brothel and stuff. And I was like, there's no way that that that's going to happen. Sure enough, (laughs) that's exactly what happens. And my girlfriend was just absolutely on it. She knew from the second they started walking, she's like, yeah, "Yeah, they're going to try and fuck. I'm like, okay. (laughs) Okay, We'll we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. I, so I, I loved it. I, Mm -hmm. I made it to the, the finale and that finale was just, oh my God. Like I, like I, I and I say this every time I've said it like four times on the podcast. I know listeners, I'm sorry, but mm. the, it there has not been a show in years where I started an episode, just kind of leaned back in my chair, casually watching it. And by the end, I'm on the edge of my yeah. seat like this, like, no, 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 no. Oh my God, <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. Oh, dude, that was like that that ending scene that whole like ending sequence was yeah. easily one of the most intense things that i've ever watched like it, i man it was bonkers Dang. so good so, so good yeah that was that was absolutely fantastic and patty considine so good in it as the so, king yeah yeah that there's i i'm not going to spoil anything for gabe but there's mm-hmm. uh the scene where I know the one. They're, I know the one. Having a dinner, he walks down and he, yep. he kind of yep. gives. He's speech. going somewhere. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, my that's god, amazing. dude. He is. That, oh yeah. Go on. That I was just gonna say that that was like, a, you know, if if the finale was the most like intense thing that I've watched in a long time, that whole sequence of him walking into that room mm. was like one of the like just best acted scenes like the the drama was so good and it wasn't like it wasn't necessarily like intense but just you could feel the room like you could feel everybody's eyes on him and just the the emotion and the like oh god it was it was so well acted it was so good yeah he's like one of our best actors by far like yeah, he is a national treasure in the UK. Mm, like, really? If, yeah, like if you know Paddy Considine is going to do some acting, you know you're in for some seriously good performance. Awesome, it's, he's incredible, what? and I'm really pleased that he's getting a much bigger uh, recognition now for his amazing skills. Nice. Like, one of my favorite films is called Dead Man's Shoes, which is kind of like a a very gritty uh, horror film. 
uh, set in close to somewhere I grew up in a, like a, a town called Matlock, which is portrayed as quite run down, very working class. And he plays a very different character in that. Uh, but I would highly recommend the film Dead Man's Shoes. It's not Dead a feel good movie. Don't okay. go in there if you're looking <laughs> for a laugh. Yeah. Uh, but it's and he in that is amazing. And he's okay. so in that he's really threatening and frightening. Nice. Like it's really good film. Go Dead. and watch Dead Man's Shoes. I'm I'm gonna add it right now because I was just about to ask <clears throat> what what else I should watch him in because I, I'm sure I've seen him in stuff, but I, I didn't really know who he was up mm -hmm. until House of the Dragon. The title looks awesome. Or I mean the mm -hmm. like the oh, cover yeah. for it. Yeah, that looks is that cool. the red one with the silhouette of the man with the axe. Yep, that one yeah. looks cool. And then there's also one, uh, the the green one where he's yes. in the green jumpsuit and he's got a shotgun and a pistol. It just looks cool. And the yeah. like yeah, the yeah. gas mask on. Yeah, that's yeah. him in it, and he's nice. terrifying. It's so good. Okay, is it a horror movie? Yes. Okay. Uh, it is a. It, I mean, it has element. It's kind of like Flasher. a realist drama. Okay. It is a it, structurally. It's probably a slasher. But it doesn't feel like a slasher mm. when you're watching it. It's probably, I would say, it's a, a realist drama thriller that is a, an intense horror movie as well. Nice. nice. That sounds okay. cool. Well, I, I want to pass it over to Gabe. Uh, the, these are kind of the best episodes to just kind of pass around the mic and see what everybody's been up to. Uh, do you have anything you want to talk about or what's been going on with you? Yeah, so I have been reading cradle oh yeah and um i so i don't know if you've heard there there's another series called uh he who fights with monsters and it's it's very it's a newer one by travis baldry it's it's the structure is you know it's the progressive kind of fantasy very similar um i would say that like cradle is like kind of like a less modern Whereas he who fights with the monsters is like, there's some urban stuff that, you know, he goes in Australia, blah, blah, blah. But I read all of he who fights with monsters and just like was astonished. It was my top, top one book of the year. Like it was just yeah. incredible. And a bunch of people, cause I was like, oh yeah, cradle, you know, cradles like just like this, they probably took. And they were like, no, no, they took from cradle. And I was like, okay, all right. Yeah. I got to <laughs> check this out. So I just finished, um, I just finished book six. And so I'm moving oh, on to book shit. seven um, and I, I love it. It got the first like three books were like, they were good, but it was just all set up, you know? Yeah. Cause like, I think like the, the progressive stuff, like I don't get super interested in it until the stakes are like high, you yeah. know, it's all ranking, you know, copper, silver, jade, gold, high gold, true gold yeah. and keeps going up. And so the character main character just got to true gold, which is like pretty up there. And so now, now he's dealing with some crazy, powerful people and i just love it man it's it's yeah. gotten so good the the last two books were like it's just gotten progressively better and better and better yeah so, like i'm like I, itching itching to start number seven yeah that's yeah. that's awesome i had a feeling i i haven't read it yeah but so many people talk about cradle and like people have like reached out to the podcast yeah. saying gabe should rate yeah cradle. <laughs> yeah and yeah. uh is well so, they'll be happy to hear yeah dude i i am super super excited to to do that review episode with yeah. you then because i think that'll be really cool and i think the uh the final book for it comes out this year yeah so i i think there's well i think there's like 13 or something right something like yeah. that so i'm yeah i'm halfway there and that makes me really happy because he who fights yeah. with monsters is only the the eighth book just came out like right december 15th or whatever and so i pick that up and i'm like this is nice because like i still yeah. got like days and days and days worth of listening before i finish it and, I, and it's already getting so crazy to the point i'm like where how much further can they go but every single book there's like new layers yeah. that just get stacked on top of yeah of i've i i've heard that once because people that's kind of what people said is like by the fourth or fifth book yeah. you, you'll know if you like it or not yes um and if you do like it then it just never slows down. Yeah. Like there, there's just never like a low point. Like every book gets better and better yeah. and better. And there's just no, there's like no downside. Yep. And so I, I think that's really cool. I'm, I'm like really happy that you're reading it just because yeah. 
like even though I haven't read it I was like I am pretty sure that Gabe would love this yeah. series so it's it's amazing that, have you read it RJ that makes you really happy cradle yes I, I have to confess I've not heard of it before oh. I was waiting to ask what a progressive fantasy it's progressive is. fantasy yeah so, do you know what lit RPG is? I know what lit RPG is. I believe okay. you're a fan of the books of Alaron Kong. Aren't I you, am. Spencer? Mm-hmm. Yes, I am. <laughs> yes. Right here. Yeah, Spencer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So go ahead, Gabe. You, you yeah, can probably so, answer it better. So pr- progressive fantasy uh, in lit RPG, you know, it's it, you're in a video game. There's rankings. There's skills that you build up. Mm-hmm. There's this and that. And I would I would classify progressive fantasy as taking taking the video game parts out of that. Right. Um, so they're still ranking and there's no like skill subset, you know, like skill. I reached level 40 in this skill, blah, blah, blah. But it's more of just like kind of tiers of power that mm-hmm. they have to work towards getting. And there's like in, in Cradle, they call it Madra. It's like mana and you have to like channel mana and you can, you know, do stuff like that. And so there's just progressively like different rankings. And and Cradle also has this aspect of like these kind of these gods that are like protecting the different realities and right and it's, the the universe is called cradle and so you you get little excerpts from like the crazy powerful gods like trying to like save the timeline and making oh. sure stuff happens and then most of it's just with the main character but yeah i don't know if i butchered that or not but that's how i would that's kind of how it makes I would a lot like, of sense to me yeah it yeah. sounds uh appealing to be honest yeah. with you it's it's um, really good do you I prefer it, it do, or do you prefer the video game elements to be in there so <laughs> I I'm a fanboy of Alaron Kong. So mm-hmm. I love I love the video game stuff just as much as I like, you know, Cradle. But but the problem is is that the land series is like the only like lit RPG that I've like really thoroughly enjoyed. Right. I've okay. listened to other ones and they just didn't really compare to the land. And so it's been hard to find stuff like that. But with this progressive fantasy, I've I've done some research. There's several different ones that like there's Cradle, he who fights with monsters, there's one other one that I can't remember that people all said it was really good so it's just yeah. kind of so it, it's kind of like about attaining ranks or attaining, attaining ranks and power yeah. and, and they, there's also like good like you know there's like a love story that's involved and and you know sure. some other elements is not just like uh, i need power type thing right um, but, but yeah. i mean like progressive fantasy yeah like you're just progressing yep yeah. it's it. amazing like I, I find it amazing there's all these genres that i've <laughs> subgenres that i've never yeah. heard yeah. of like i find it so so interesting that there's all this stuff out there like for a long time i hadn't heard of lit up as a re- recent discovery yeah for yeah. me lit up in fact i think it was your guys podcast listening to it that made me go lit rpg what is this yeah. <laughs> and uh and looked into that and so progressive yeah. Uh, it's very interesting as well. Yep. So does the satisfaction come from achieving, like your personal satisfaction yes. comes from seeing these things achieved by that character, att- attaining ideas, Yes, I, I think I think that's where it stems from. I, I think it's from attaining. And, and then also a part parts that I really enjoy is like with obtaining these powers, like, like there's situations, like if they were the rank below, they mm-hmm. probably would have died, but they just reached right. this rank. And so now they have enough power to like defeat this thing that's in sure. front of them or do the challenge. And so, yeah, that's, mm-hmm. yeah, I think, I think that's probably where the satisfaction comes from. It's the ranking up and just like attaining enough power to do what the character needs to do. Sure. That's, that's cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy you're enjoying it because yeah. like, even, even though, like and for all I know, I might enjoy He Who Fights Monsters or Cradle if that yeah. video game element is. I think removed. you would probably like Cradle more. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll definitely have to check it out. But yeah, I'm just so happy that you're enjoying it because I think yeah. like even if I don't like something, I enjoy it when other people yep. are finding something totally. that they enjoy. So yeah, I think that's really really cool. Yeah. You're also playing a lot of playstation right now you just got yes. a playstation for christmas yes i got a ps5 nice. for christmas he, he joined the the sony ponies are you a sony <laughs> yeah. pony rj yeah i'm a sony pony nice awesome. okay <laughs> is this so, a term you've invented no I, I never around. heard it i never heard it until he told me <laughs> no, i love it yeah it, it's typically reserved for the people that like kind of get into like the console wars a little bit oh right okay and and like the the xbox people were calling the sony people sony ponies and then we just like adopted it as like our badge of honor yeah yeah. Um, (laughs) and so i i love the term 
I mean, uh, Sony PlayStation's great. Ponies are great. How yeah, is that an insult? That's right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But um, yes, I have so been playing you... a lot of PlayStation. I so when I when I first got it, um, it came with you know it was the God of War edition, the God of War Ragnarok or whatever edition. I actually yeah. haven't. I downloaded that. I haven't played it yet because on the PlayStation Plus catalog, free games you can download. Ghost of Tsushima. Oh yeah, was yeah. on there. Yeah, and so I like wasn't sure. So I asked Spencer, and he's like, "Yeah, it's kind of like imagine like kind of a ninja Assassin's Creed, like samurai Assassin's Creed." And I was like say less that's all i need yeah mm -hmm. and so i started playing that and i've just been hooked it's got its yeah. hooks in deep every day i play like i try and i'll probably play for an hour every day if not more yeah. um and so i'm like i think i'm probably a little over halfway done with the main story but i've been doing like oh, wow. a lot of side quests yeah mm -hmm. um and so i'm just i'm i'm in, i'm in for the long haul with that game so i'm, I'm gonna finish that game before i play anything else yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That's cool. Are, are, have you played that, RJ? You'd probably like it. What, Ghost of Tsushima? Yep. Yeah. No, unfortunately, I haven't. Basically, all of last year, I played Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Oh, Pretty yes. Pretty much just that. Yes. Same right? with Gabe, yeah. I, yes. <laughs> and I just get put so much time into it. I think I need to not play open world games massive <laughs> yeah. open world rpgs yeah. for a while because like i recently um had a la end of last year i had quite bad depressive episode i was like i need to get out of a rut what have i not done played yeah. video games yeah hardcore. so i was like i smashed through like well i finished assassin's creed valhalla finally yep and then i smashed through star wars squadrons and oh how was um, that Good, so much fun, really good. Awesome. Not played a space combat simulator since I was a child. It brought back all my memories of Tie nice. Fighter. Brilliant, nice. so good. Did it feel like a like a Star Fox kind of thing where you're just flying and shooting people? Or I've not played Star Fox, oh, okay. uh, but it it felt like a modern. There was I don't know how old you go back with gaming but there was some great games there was the first one was x-wing and the second one was tie fighter yeah and it very much feels like the successor of x-wing and tie fighter it's like nice. full-on space combat simulator uh but you get to play both from the imperial side and from the republic oh, side. Cool. sides yeah it's tons of fun really good story as well actually nice. um and then i blasted through star wars battlefront 2 solo campaign oh nice i knew that was short and yep. i could hammer it through and that was a lot of fun um and now i've been playing the bioshock yes oh, Spencer's because i'd never played them before and oh, like oh god yes oh my <laughs> god like i know they're from 2060 no wait earlier than that they they age so well yeah, like oh I played God. Bioshock and I was like, I think this is my favorite game of all time now. Yeah, like, this is insane. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I haven't played modern. St I don't have a PlayStation 5, so I haven't played big open world games like Ghost of Tsushima because I feel like I need to just play some very focused, yeah. tight yeah. narrative yep. games like I can blast through. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm playing Bioshock Infinite right now. Yes, um, dude, that's my favorite one. Oh my god, it's really good. Yeah, I'm just it's battling so through all of them. But yeah. I did get for Christmas God of War Ragnarok, so I'm looking forward to tucking into that. Yep, because uh, the first God of War is um well, first the first yeah. Norse. Yeah, God of War. yeah, yeah. Amazing. I love the old ones. Greek mythology is my jam, definitely. Yeah, but yeah. I very you know the the Norse one is amazing. So I'm looking forward to Ragnarok, and I also got Resident Evil Village. So I'm oh, very much to nice! That, well. that that's the newest one, right? I'm pretty yeah, sure. I think so. Yeah, I've seen some yeah, gameplay on that, and I feel like I would really like it. It looks looks really cool. Yeah, yeah. it looks yeah. terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Spencer doesn't do horror games. Yeah, not really. At least I, there's been a couple that I've gotten into, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, man, I dude, I am so happy that you're playing Bioshock Infinite. It's literally like one of my top three games of, been, yeah. of all time, if not my favorite. It's, it's stunning. So good. It's, it's so, so good. good. Like there are moments when I've come around a corner and gone literally said out loud. Wow. Yeah. And this is a game that came out in what? 20. I don't know. But like it's a 2014 or something. Or something. 2012. Yeah. yeah. It's like, isn't it a PlayStation 3 game, yeah. Bioshock Infinite? Yeah. Uh, I'm still going like, wow, because yeah. the design is incredible. What they do with the light, like the graphics are, for an old game, insane. Yeah. Like, 
the la- the way they so cleverly use lighting and the clouds and the color palette and the floating city in the background it's not like extremely uh i imagine it's not extremely demanding like right, many yeah. more complicated stuff is but what they do is like the design is incredible so it still looks absolutely amazing purely yeah. through the art of it not so much how powerful the machine needs to be to to render right. what is yeah. asking of it yeah it's kind of like uh you know like the legend of zelda like wind waker game mm. where the those graphics will never age because they're not like super high fidelity they're more i guess cartoonish i guess yeah um, and so it's like that that ages really really well yeah yeah um and i i feel like the bioshock games do that to like mm-hmm. the extreme um yeah. and and then the story dude the story of bioshock infinite is so good A- about how far are you do you know uh i kind of don't want to give spoilers for the people because i'm, <laughs> I'm a bit like uh um, farther yeah I- i'm like um Normally, I'd go, oh, it's an old game. Like, you should have yeah. played it, but I haven't played it. So I haven't I, played I, it right. either. Yeah. There right, we so. go. Yeah. Yep. Okay. But uh, there is, does, would a ghost mean anything yes. to you? Yeah, Spencer? absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, 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 there's a ghost thing okay. that I've just got past the level with a ghost thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah that's where I am. You're you're pretty close to the end then. Yeah, it feels like I've been really hammering through these games. I've been dreaming yeah. about them. I yeah. want a Bioshock tattoo. That's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude the uh, the ending, like that final cutscene, will blow your mind like nothing else. And I look forward to it. Our uh, our other co-host Chris, I I got him into that game uh, this mm-hmm. last year as well, and he yeah. just finished it. Um, I think a, a few weeks ago. Yeah. And he texted me, and he was like, "I did not see that coming." Yeah, it, like that absolutely floored me, and so I I love it when people get to the end of that game because it's yeah. it's like nothing else. It's just like nothing else. I and have then, to say, I prefer the first one, the first couple actually. That's fair. Um, uh, I just think Rapture is just like Columbia is extremely cool. Yeah, and I think uh, the Prophet Comstock is a great villain, but I just found um, what's his face ah uh, Look, the guy. No, no, in in Bioshock, who's oh. talking to you and taunting oh, you. Oh, yeah, Andrew. Um, Andrew Ryan. Andrew that's Ryan, it. Yeah. I think he's such a good character. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, the twist in um, there's a scene in Bioshock with a golf club, which is absolutely jaw dropping for me. And there is a twist in Bioshock which made me go, oh, shit, (laughs) which I, you know, yeah. Yeah. Although I I am loving, um, and I'll have to speak to you about this in DMs, I am loving Infinite, but there is a thing that's happened where I'm like, I don't think that makes logical sense story-wise. Okay. Yeah. Which is quite major in my opinion, Mm. but other than that, I'm loving it. Yeah, you'll you'll have to let me know. Do (laughs) I need any, like, if, if I was to pick up Infinite, do I... Should I play them in order or not at all? I mean, you should, but if you yeah. don't feel like you have time to, you can just play Infinite. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Infinite is Infinite is very self-contained. The only way that it relates to the other games is in the DLC. And that's what I was going to tell you, RJ, is yeah. wh- when you finish the main campaign, I- I'm sure you have like the collector's edition or whatever. Yeah, I do. Yeah. All the collection. Yeah. Yeah. Sin- especially since you just played one and two. Mm-hmm. Like, make sure you play the DLC because it tells you how, it it tells you how they all connect, That's and so cool. and it's it's mind blowing. It's really mm-hmm. really cool. I was also gonna say if you're if you're enjoying Bioshock and you want more of that, uh, you gotta play Dishonored. Dishonored. Uh, one yeah, and I two. should shouldn't I? Yeah, dude, it it is like you'll get into Dishonored and you'll be like, this is what I love about Bioshock. Mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. it it has more like stealth mechanics and you can like crawl through like vents and kind of circumvent your way around certain enemies and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and it it, it's really cool that it's one of those games that forces you to think in creative ways and then you feel like extremely smart for figuring out 
the thing. Um, and it's just like, I, I don't want to say like the story is whatever, but like, like, especially the story in the first one is really good, but it's more just the world, like the, what you learn about this world and what you learn about these characters are some of the most interesting things. Cause mm-hmm. there's, yeah, there's a whole lot of like environmental world building. Yeah. Where, I love environmental storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. And like, there's some things that it'll come out and say like, oh, there was this rat plague all these years ago and that's how we got to where we are now. But there's a lot of things in the game where you just kind of look around at the city and you're like, oh, I see what happened there. And I, I yeah. To, uh, yeah, and so it's it's really, really cool that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so good, so good. Like, it's interesting you mentioned like all the stealth stuff that, you know, you said stuff you love about Bioshock. I'm like the opposite with Bioshock. I'm like, I'm going to go in, I'm going to set everyone on fire, <laughs> yeah. electrocute everyone, yeah. and then like just unload my, you know, six barrel shotgun into everybody. I'm like the opposite <laughs> of stealth in Bioshock. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love all the ways that you can get creative with Bioshock too. You can either be somebody that uses all your uh, like vigors or whatever and yeah. like your magic. Um, or you can like, my main thing was, uh, what did I use? I, it was, uh, I think it was the shotgun and the uh, little grenade launcher. And I would just use both of those and just go yeah. around and clean house. So good. So yeah. good. I love the uh, the hand cannon in Bioshock Infinite. Just this enormous oh, yeah. revolver yeah. that just blows people's heads off. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Oh, and I love it when you electrocute people. I don't know why <laughs> this physically happens, but when you electrocute people, they start like juddering. And then if you shoot them, their head pops off the top. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. good. <laughs> also, I, what in Bioshock 2, I love, like Bioshock is so grimdark, like the first two. Yeah. I love that in Bioshock 2, where you play a big daddy, like, and you, when you're carrying a little sister around, like, and if you electrocute people or if you shoot them and they start like juddering around with being shot, your your little sister's on your shoulder and she's like, look at them dance, daddy. Oh look my at them God. Dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. Rapture is creepy, dude. That is yeah. that is grimdark as hell, man. It's so grimdark. I yeah. love it. I didn't yeah. realize it would be that grimdark. It's right. Super bleak. Yeah, dude. just that. I mean, it, it throws you right into it at the beginning of the game where you walk down that thing and there's just that baby carriage. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it just has like a ton of blood in it. And yeah, it's yeah. like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, so good. it's brutal. It have we talked now. about what you've been doing, Spencer? Yeah, so, let's hear about that. Yeah. Oh, I haven't been doing much. I I've been focused a ton on trying to find a roommate. And Mm -hmm. so I've had multiple people come through to look at this room that I'm trying to rent out. And it has just been awful. It is is the worst process. And I finally talked to my cousin last night and he had recommended getting on some of these apps. Like there's Mm -hmm. specific apps for doing this. Um, And I'm like, I got to do that, man. Cause like, I got to find a better pool of people because some of these guys that have come by to look at this room i'm just like man you're either like just recovered from drugs or (laughs) you can't hold a job or like Uh all all these different things i just keep getting all these uh just weird people and it's like hey i've been there you know like i i get it but Mm -hmm. at the same time like you know i'm at a pretty good place in life i have this nice house that i'm renting and i want to make sure that I get a roommate who is really, really chill, reliable. preferably, yeah, reliable, preferably mm-hmm. around my age. Uh, this one guy sent me a picture with his, uh, not resume, but like when I sent him like questions and stuff, he, he, when he reached out to me over email, he sent me a picture with it. And in the picture, he was about, I don't know, somewhere between 25 and 30 turns out that picture is about 25 years old (laughs) um and so he he showed up and he's like in his 50s and and i don't like i don't mind like an older roommate but i'm like dude just like be honest like you don't need to like send me a picture of you when you're 25 like 
and so just I don't know everybody that I've had come look at it has just been super weird and and even the guy that was like the best fit up until now that I was like well if all else fails I'll go with this guy he just texted me yesterday and he's like hey just to let you know I just got laid off from my job today and so he's like I can give you like two months of rent ahead of time but I'll be looking for a job and stuff and Mm -hmm. I'm just like oh god okay so yeah just looking for a roommate has been really weird yeah you have my uh, sympathies that does sound like a rough rough thing to do yeah it's it's nuts um but other than that I don't know I haven't been doing too much I, I haven't even really been playing that many video games uh i'm still doing fallout uh yeah. i think i think i'm really close to the to the end there oh um, you haven't you haven't even beat it yet no i've been doing all the like uh, side yeah missions, okay okay settlements gotcha. and stuff yeah. fallout 4 yeah fallout 4 yeah yeah and uh and i'm i'm just to the point where like uh there's going to be like an uprising at the institute mm. and so i i think i'm pretty much near the end there yeah but uh but yeah other than that i've been reading the vagrant i i talked about that a little bit earlier it it's about this guy who is wandering through a wasteland and mm. he's got like this baby that he hides under his coat uh that you really don't know anything about even i'm i'm probably three quarters of the way through the book and we still don't know anything about the baby other than this is something that he needs to protect and it it reminds me a lot of the mandalorian in the way where uh this main character is mute and so he he doesn't speak at all and so he it's really interesting because you see people interacting with him and it's not like like he doesn't even do like sign language like he he communicates through body language like either weight or you know something like that um but there's really no way for him to communicate and so it's really interesting because it forces you as the reader to judge him as a person based on his actions rather than what he says and i i feel like especially me i i'm always the one on the podcast who writes down all the the quotes that I like from various characters and uh, mm-hmm. all the things they say. And so it's it's forced me to like there there are no quotes. There yeah. there are no, you know, uh, you know, eloquent speeches or anything for me to be like, yeah, he's a great character, or like any witty mm-hmm. dialogue or anything like that. Like I have to judge him based on what he is physically doing in the book. And I think that that's such an interesting idea. And it's forced me to think a lot more deeply about the character than I probably would have if he was just some rogue wandering through the wasteland who's kind of witty and doing rogue stuff. And then you get these fallout elements where there are like these mutant creatures in this wasteland. And there there is like this old technology that nobody really knows exactly how to use anymore like they they know kind of how to use it but not really um and so there's like all these massive junk piles of like old computers and you know handheld devices and stuff uh and so it's it's really interesting to to see that part of the world where it's like oh yeah imagine we had an apocalypse you get four generations removed our computers are probably still around, but people aren't going to know exactly like what they were used for. Like if all of our history died yeah. and, and everything got nuked, you know, people wouldn't exactly know like what a smartphone is. They, they'd probably figure out that there's like a flashlight on it or something, mm-hmm. but, but they wouldn't know that it's like a communication device. And so I, I think that bit of world building is is really interesting uh yeah. as well um and i'm i'm just really really enjoying it it is more of like a complex book i think um and there's been a few times where i've had to go back like an entire chapter or two uh just to kind of remember what exactly is going on um but man i i really really love it i'm i'm really into it right now 
and it's called the vagrant the vagrant yeah and oh, yeah. the audiobook is good as well yeah i've added it to my list yeah my uh uh, uh wish list tbr on... yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> um it's interesting about the technology that's one of my favorite things about um warhammer 40,000 fiction is that like mankind has essentially gone through a second dark ages but it's like set in the 41st millennium so things are it's like that idea but it's way kind of like more extreme to the yeah. point where they worship the machines like yeah um you know there's this cult the cult mechanicus the adeptus mechanicus who are like Basically, to make machines work, they think they have to do all of these religious rituals and oh. wave incense <laughs> yep, and yep. like, yeah, and they, cool. they like AI in it is uh, they believe is the machine spirit, and they think there are spirits within these ancient machines. It's actually wow. AI, but okay. we never know. So like, they have to appease the machine spirit, yep. and like, you know, if a machine's not working, they're like the machine spirit is angry. It must be appeased with these yeah. rituals <laughs> right. and stuff. It's it's really cool. I like. I love the way sci-fi can put, um, uh, you know, just take something which to you is really mundane and ordinary right. and make it this kind of like artifact of wonder yeah. to the peoples of yeah. the future. I think it's such a fun thing. Yeah, there's a, sure. You know, there's these memes in, uh, you know, the 40K community about uh, how um, the Adeptus Mechanicus like worship toasters. They're obsessed with toasters. <laughs> and stuff. Oh, yeah. That's wonderful awesome. device, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. What um, part of the, like the book series of Warhammer would feature that most prominently? God, I mean, there's a billion books. Okay. Uh, so maybe the great, the great work. It's just, it's not like any of the Adeptus Mechanicus books. So there's a book series called, or there's a book called The Great Work uh, about Belisari, a character called Belisarius Call. Um, who is like the the uh, the arch? You know, he is the leader of this faction called the Adeptus Mechanicus and their their religion, the Cult Mechanicus. So they're not my favorite faction. Right. Um, so I read about other factions quite a lot, but that's a very good book, and that contains quite quite a lot of stuff in it. It's okay. it's something. Anything with that faction in the book is they will talk about their worship of machines, and that's like the core of that faction faction yeah. they worship machines especially old if anything is old in the 41st millennium before like the downfall of mankind essentially it's considered yeah. like older the better to those people mm. okay um so yeah it just any any book with them in will probably scratch that itch okay cool do well, they like oh, do they sorry. like use these machines or just worship them yeah, they tr well, they use them when they're working. Like yeah, okay. everything is broken and falling yeah. apart, and they use them when they're working. Gotcha. So yeah, they they do. Yeah, gotcha. Um, to to the best of their ability. Yep. Right. Um, what they know how to do, anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. What they can work out, like so, or or they create new machines based on what they think old machines are. Yeah. So they've got like um these planes which look like um Leonardo da Vinci's flying. Oh, yeah. because they found schematics for that and they assumed like that's what planes were like yep. back in the oh, day so okay. they've tried to create yeah um, <laughs> they've tried to create planes along the basis of that rather than using what we now nowadays now right. no nowadays are yeah. much better designs for planes okay that's cool man mm -hmm. yeah the every time but, but, i Every time I hear you talk about Warhammer, I want to check it out more and more. So cool. Like they have these things, these, these, they like ATS, you know, chicken walkers. They've got like small versions of those, um, which they ride around on this, this faction. And they have like, they're really old, these things and the technology to make them is lost. So they have a, from when mankind was at its highest, which is way in our future, but way in their past. They actually have like perpetual motion in these um, these dragoons, I think they're called. So um, they con they never run out of energy. They're constantly moving. Oh, but wow. if they turn them off, they can't turn them back on again. Oh. So they, like so, they store them on treadmills. They have to like hook them up onto treadmills. <laughs> they just keep walking keep forward, yeah, and until like it's time to use them, and they take them off the treadmill and <laughs> go and use them again. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, since we're talking about Warhammer, I'll wrap us up with uh, two questions here. I think they're both fairly quick. Mm -hmm. um, 
so what so you you paint a lot of warhammer yeah figurines. yeah mm-hmm. um part of this question is is this kind of like a, a side hustle like do you do you sell these figurines and stuff and also have you thought about making a youtube channel where you paint these things because that's really popular <laughs> it is very popular i've not thought about it purely because I know a lot of work goes into making YouTube yeah. channels and it's not something I have the time or the resources yeah. for. Um, I have other things I wanted that I'm working on in my yep. spare time. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't do that um, I, as much as enjoyable that would be. Um, but I get commissioned. I mean, I most the overwhelming majority of my painting is for me because uh, yeah. I enjoy painting it and I enjoy owning it. And yeah. I'm building the armies and then playing the game with my armies nice. uh, and then losing all the time because <laughs> uh, I'm a terrible general. Um, but uh, yeah, I do get painting commissions as well. So people send me their models. i am got to be quite a good painter. Uh, so people will send me their models and give me some money and I will paint their models for them so they look nice. Uh, it cool. might be people who aren't don't have the time to do it or it might be people who... Um, don't feel very confident or don't feel they're very good in their painting right. and I paint them up and uh, send them back. Cool. So yeah, That's... it's a little side hustle. It's nothing big, nothing major, yeah. but it's, you know, it's pocket money, you know, it's a little yeah, bit right. of pocket money. Yeah. That's, that's cool. Yeah. Every time you've posted some of your pictures of your mm-hmm. painted figures, I'm like, wow, he's, he's put a lot of time <laughs> into this. Um, and I, I, I used to paint, figures uh a while back um and Mm. i was doing it purely for money i never played the game or anything Mm -hmm. uh but i i figured out when i was younger because i i was really into like just creative stuff and and so i had like an airbrush and i had all these different types of brushes and powders and stuff Mm. and so i i would buy these either warhammer figurines or what was really big at the time was war machine yeah um, and so I'd, I'd paint those and I figured out that if you painted them well, that figurine is now worth at least four times more than what you bought it for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I would, I would just get these figurines and paint them and sell them. And yeah, it was, it was a great, great little Good hustle. idea. Good yeah. idea. I kind of feel like I should do that, but then I'd paint it and be like, oh, I'd really like that. Yeah. I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm there, gonna keep that one. Yeah, yep. there, there was a few that I kept for sure because I was <laughs> like, man, that is super cool. Or, or I'd give them to like my uncle because he's really into like either D and D or like Warhammer uh-huh. or stuff like that. So I pass those on to him. But um, I have I have a buddy over here uh, to the state that I moved to. I, I have a buddy over here who is really into Star Wars, and yeah. so we're just about to buy the uh, Star Wars Legion awesome. starter set. Mm-hmm. And it, it for I think it's 120 bucks. It comes with two armies. I think you get like 10 figures each. Mm-hmm. And so we're planning on splitting the set and then just sitting down for a day and like painting all these figures mm-hmm. and then uh, starting to play the game. It'll be the first time that I've actually played like a, you know, a tabletop yeah. like, battle game. And uh, I'm really excited. I, I have to imagine that it, it can't be that different from Warhammer in the way that it plays. No. Like, it, it looks like they have like rulers and stuff that they move yeah. around with. All tabletop war games are essentially moving toy soldiers around and trying to kill each other. Yeah. Do you know who invented uh, tabletop war gaming? Who? H.G. Wells. Really? Oh. Yeah. War of the Worlds. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. War of the Worlds, Time Machine, uh, The Invisible Man, The cool. Island of Dr. Moreau. He, like, H.G. Wells is was the man. Like, it is... I, I, wow. I mean, it, you could never understate, understate his ingenuity and creativity and his really? impact on fiction at all. Like, all of those things he came up with. Like, he's insane. But, what like what tabletop game did he make? So he, I think it was called Little Soldiers or Little Armies uh, or li- uh, Little Wars. Hold on, Little Wars HG. Yeah, so it was called Little Wars, and it was like a very early tabletop war game uh, okay. made in 1913. Um, wow. So yeah, I think it was maybe his child or or a nephew had toy soldiers, so he created like a set of rules to yeah to play a proper formalized game with them 
Um, so yeah, it was he invented tabletop wargaming in 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 its modern version. His full name, hilariously, and because it's Victorian, it is sexist, but it was called <laughs> Little Wars, a game for boys from 12 years of age to 150. And for that more intelligent sort of girl who likes boys' <laughs> games and books. <laughs> oh my God, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he uh, yeah he 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 kind of invented modern tabletop wargaming. Yeah. That's that's wild. That's super yeah. cool. Um. All right. So I have one final question before I do our outro here, and we can all answer this if we like, but RJ, what makes audiobook narrating so different from doing other voiceover work? Because I know you do stuff for like, you've, you've done stuff for like video games and stuff like yeah. that, right? Um, yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, kind of as a secondary thing, why, why are audiobooks and their narrators so special? Like, why is that such a unique thing? Uh, good question. Um, so we, I mean, audiobook narration is very different to other voice acting because you do everything and it's yeah. extreme, can see it's very long form, right? So, yeah, you're looking at you know, if if you do, you know, I've done like very small video games, I've done um, corporate stuff, uh, and that is a short amount of time, you know, minutes at a time, uh, when it comes to corporate stuff. Um, or adverts audiobooks you're looking at out 20 hours of solid narration or right. something you know and it's not just that there is a, you know the acting voice acting there is other preparation as well but I think with audiobooks there's a great deal of preparation because you are doing every single character but not only that you are doing the prose which to me is a character as yeah. well like oh yeah so like I don't narrate in my normal voice as as listeners might know if they've heard my stuff. Yeah. I actually am hugely influenced by, as mentioned, Richard Burton. Um, so I narrate a bit posher. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it's a lot of preparation because you've got to, you know, if you've got uh, several different accents, you're not doing the one person, you're doing multiple acting, yeah. multiple actors jobs all at once for one right. project, basically. Yeah or voice actors jobs i should say for for every hour of audio audiobook it's about six hours work goes into every one audio one wow. audiobook hour uh, so it's yeah. a lot of work That's i think nice. also it's it's really a passion and thing as well because audiobook narrators don't earn the good pay if you want the good pay you know corporate adverts tv yeah. stuff yeah. like that you know i did a, a radio advert recently and i earned like 650 pounds for an hour oh wow. hours wow. work no, yeah no prep necessary like yeah. <laughs> i gnarly. wish i got that for audiobooks yeah. Yeah. yeah um so and i'm not saying that to show off i'm trying sure. to demonstrate no yeah, how yeah, yeah. Much totally. a yep. radio advert might pay you compared to what an audio there's a full audio book yeah right yeah yeah and that that ultimately that amount of audios on a radio is going to be 30 seconds long yeah, <laughs> yeah. no kidding just wow um, so, so there is the difference there. It's definitely a passion thing. Um, why are audiobook narrators so special? I feel, you know, a bit arrogant saying, oh, I'm special. Oh, go for it. Uh, but I think I've just said why they're special in a way. Yeah. The fact yeah. that they do that, yeah. like they will do one project for an audiobook narrator can be like 20 hours, yeah. 28 hours, you know, huge amounts yep. of audio for one thing. And main character for that long on a single project you know, and doing all your prep. Audiobook narrators also edit on the fly. Like yeah. we're also editors and we do editing. Um, if you're not working with a production house or a producer, you're doing the proofing, you're doing everything, you're doing the mastering. So you're a sound, you're an audio engineer and right. you're a voice actor. Right. Um, so yeah, there's a huge amount of stuff that you need to do, not just performance, but on the technical side also, right. uh, which normally in other industry someone else would take care of all of that yep. stuff right uh, but you know it's industry standard now to do punch and roll which is essentially editing on the fly yeah, yeah. so you are asked to edit stuff if you turn in an audiobook to a uh, producer 
and you haven't done punch and roll typically they'll send it back because like that's yeah. not acceptable these right. days like because that's just and an, an, it's way too much to work to ask someone to do right all that editing on top of the proofing and the normal editing that one would do in the mastering etc so nice. yeah that's why it's like a huge amount of work um and it's so much uh, passion in it and so much love for the art form and for their authors and for the author's works because you know no one gets into audiobook narration to get rich yeah. right <laughs> more about the passion too yeah i think that's yeah the most Absolutely. important piece because it, it really is it really is remarkable as you were saying the amount of work that goes into it because like yeah you, you just i'm just repeating what you said but it's it's remarkable <laughs> no, i appreciate it that's Thank you. it's it that's a fantastic answer and i i do want to shoot it over to you gabe for a second i'll, I'll rephrase it a bit because uh and, and this is kind of part of what went into me thinking about this question was before you know we started listening to audiobooks together like you you weren't really reading at all right and and i i had read like physical books before but not nearly as frequently as i do now yeah. and so what has kind of changed for you now now reading audiobooks it's it's probably opened up a whole new world that you didn't even know yeah was there, absolutely right? yeah yeah, I mean, I, you know, you, you're the one that introduced me to fantasy, period. Like, it was, seriously, like, it was, I just had never, I mean, I've heard of it, I heard of sci-fi, but I just didn't read anything. Like, I love video games, that was my fantasy, right? That was right. where I would do that. And so, yeah, starting to read audiobooks, and it's, and it's just, I think audiobooks are just the shit, because, like, I, if, if there were no audiobooks, I would not read. It's just how it is. I don't have time for it. Right. Like I, I'm, I work 10 hours a day and I'm constantly moving. And so like being able to listen to that is such a lifesaver. And I've just really, really love them and appreciate them. And so, yeah, I mean, I've, I, I've listened in the last two years, I, you know, I've listened to 300 different books, Yeah. like just crazy <laughs> amount of books. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's just open up the whole entire, the whole thing. It's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for me, I think, um, so I, I've been trying to get this Kickstarter going for uh, Thomas Howard Riley. He wrote We Break Immortals. It was my mm -hmm. number one favorite of this last year. And I've really wanted to find a way to get him an audiobook because, you know, audiobooks are expensive. So yeah. we're going to try to crowdfund it. And people have asked me, like, you know, why are you, why would you go through so much work just to see like this, you know, just to see this get turned into an audiobook? And that question is what made me like really kind of ruminate on this over the past couple of days. But first of all, that book is incredible. It's a book that I believe in very strongly. And I, yeah. I think that it having an audiobook would make it that much better and increase the audience and all that stuff. But also I've, I've really realized like how much I believe in audiobooks as an art form, yeah. as a media. Um, I think that, you know, audiobooks do so many things for us in the way that, and that's, and that's why I asked you that question is because you're a perfect example of, you know, there's so many people out there that until the past, I don't know, five or six years weren't really reading. Like they, yeah. like nobody, nobody was really just into reading a book. Mm -hmm. And since the rise of Audible, since the rise of, you know, Libby and, and all these other apps that allow you to check out audiobooks, you know, nobody, si since that's become a thing, it's become more accessible for all these people to explore these stories that yeah. I've, I've loved since I was, you know, a young teenager and now, cause it's, it's so much harder to it, like, it would be so hard for me to reach out to my cousin and be like, Hey, like read this book. Like, I think you'd really like it. He'd be like, man, I'm not going to read a book. Yeah, Are you I don't crazy? have time for that. When Sorry, I sent it's, him, it's a big ask. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. But, but when I sent him an audio book, I was like, you can listen to this in the car. When you go to the gym, you can listen to it. And he listened to Dresden Files for the first time. And, you know, he hasn't like gotten hooked on the series yeah. or anything, but that still never would have been possible yep. without audiobooks. 
And I just think it's so incredible, not only that side of things, but what narrators do as far as bringing the story to life. There is so many ways where a narrator can take a story that's bad and make it awesome, or they can even, you know, obviously take a story that's already good and make it incredible. And I've seen that happen so many times where, you know, there was a book that I enjoyed from my teenage years, listened to the audiobook, and I like it even more because that narrator, you know, cared about it and they brought that to life and made it like this big production that we can enjoy. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I have so much respect for all the narrators out there who are doing this work and just bringing these, these already amazing stories, not only to life, but also now to a much bigger audience. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's really, really fantastic. Well, I appreciate that as a narrator. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, that, uh, that's probably a good place to, uh, end us on then. Yeah. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. so. Um, well, thank you, RJ, for hanging out yes. with us. We always love yes. having you on the channel and just kind of dicking around for a bit. <laughs> these are my, these are like some of my favorite episodes here. Yeah, dude, like, the, yeah. the, the creator's corner is episodes yes. were like, they're such amazing. A great call. Like I, I love, I love doing the creator's corner episodes because we get to have like a little bit of a topical discussion and then we can just go yep. kind of free for all wherever we want to and just hang yeah. out. So I, yeah, I, I really, it. I really love that. Um, but yeah, thank you for, I know it's, you know, probably kind of late there. We kept you a little longer than I expected to, but <laughs> dude, thank, thank you so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate having you on here. Thank you for um, asking me to come back on. I loved it. Uh, it was just as much fun, if not more fun than the previous times I've been on. So thank you yeah. very much. Nice. Yeah. We'll have to get you and, uh, you and Holly on the next time one of yep. her books comes out. That'll be great. Mm -hmm. That'll be fun. All right, guys. Well, we are going to wrap it up there. Be sure to check out all of RJ's creative endeavors. I will link all his stuff down in the description. If you're an author who's been considering making an audiobook, you should definitely reach out to RJ. I've heard from so many people that he's an absolute joy to work with. And as a reader, I can tell you that he is absolutely one of the very best in the business. And we're incredibly lucky to have him on the show. By the way, it helps the channel a ton when you like and subscribe. And if you'd like to follow us even further, we have Twitter and Discord linked below, as well as our second channel that we're hoping to add more content to this year, where we talk about movies, games, and TV shows. Thank you all so much for watching. And until next time, I have to go buy Gabe some new socks. <laughs> Ran out of socks. <laughs>